morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, familiar faces, some in the room from the uh, launch across the road of the uh, uh, Austin University Creative Industries Institute just recently, uh, earlier on. Um, I'm uh, Anthony Lilly, say so, uh, behind me, um, and I'm their MC for the day, um, or for the first half of the day this morning. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a council member of the HRC and as the chair of the um, Creative Industries Clusters Programme. Um, I'm going to fill a couple of roles. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a starter um, now in terms of the context and where the programme came from, where the funding came from, and what sort of objectives and ideas are standing behind it. Uh, then we'll have um, two keynotes. Uh, really, really delighted to welcome uh, Moya Doherty um, and Phil Morrow to talk to us um, this morning. Um, then uh, I'll do a bit of a double act with my um, friend Dylan from the HRC, who's here down the front, where we'll take you through some more detail on the programme itself, a um, uh, bit of data, various um, sort of uh, more detailed perspectives, and take a few questions at the high level. Uh, then we have a panel after um, um, the, uh, the, the, the briefing session. Uh, and then this afternoon, those of you who are staying, um, there will be a more focused session for the, the people who are actually going to be uh, writing, uh, writing the bid. Um, so the context that we're in um, is uh, around about five years ago, the HRC made some investments, um, um, actually all in England, I think, um, in um, four uh, hubs for um, uh, the uh, relationship between universities and principally cultural institutions, knowledge exchange hubs. And um, that was a sort of uh, an exercise in um, investing money to help those universities that won those bids to, to think about how they worked in an interdisciplinary way um, with um, the cultural industries and some of the creative industries. And that was sort of the first foray into that territory. And um, I joined the HRC towards the end of that programme as a council member and was involved in, in the, the sort of wash-up and the, and the assessment uh, process of what, was, what we'd learned from those and what was interesting and what perhaps uh, we, might, we might do next. So uh, I then took on, at the council level, the responsibility for working with Andrew Thompson, who's the chief executive of the HRC. Professor Thompson um, has been there around about a year now, but on the council or before that, for looking um, at what we should do next with the HRC's core investment. The HRC's, uh, I don't need to do, uh, explain to most people in this room, is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. It's the, 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 the single largest um, um, funder of um, um, arts and uh, humanities research um, in, the, in the UK, um, and um, we were looking then at what we should do next, following on from the, from the Hub project. Um, and we, we took ourselves around um, various bits of the country, um, including in Scotland, a number of Northern Irish colleagues came over for a workshop that we did looking at what the HRC's general strategy from its core funding should be. Um, and we came to the conclusion that uh, it should probably be focused around specific challenges, which were about the future of the creative industries, which were... Um, tractable, if you like, or could be um, engaged with by research institutions. Um, and this was something we were doing under our own steam to try and think through what we would do with the core money of the HRC. Uh, and then the government announced its industrial strategy, um, which um, includes within it uh, a thing called the Industrial um, Strategy Challenge Fund, which the funding we're going to talk about today uh, comes from, which is a very significant sum of new money into the research base, um, focused on particular industrial strategy challenges, uh, quite helpfully titled. Um, and um, there was a bidding process that, that we had to go through um, to, to try and position the work we were um, interested in doing in the creative industries at the funding council level into the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. And I'll take you through a little bit later um, some of the data about the scale of the creative industries, the importance economically, but also culturally and socially, of uh, what happens in these industries, um, the scale of jobs, the potential for growth, all those things which are very important to the industrial strategy. And, and I'll say probably more times than I should today, uh, this funding is a very particular kind of funding. It is about industrial strategy challenge fund <coughs> objectives, and those are heavily around long-term growth, long-term jobs, um, excellence in industrial sectors, Dealing with industrial, uh, dealing with change driven by technology or demographics or whatever they're driven by, and export, and the, very importantly, um, export, international trade, and the post-Brexit 
um, sort of environment. So, put bluntly, the industrial strategy survived the politics of the last period, which is, puts it in the list of approximately one thing, I think, um, that survived the politics, um, and, and we went forward with a bid. Now, this is new territory for the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, because I've been around creative industries policy in, in, my, in my sort of non-executive life. My executive life, I founded a digital media company which grew to a certain size. Um, I work uh, now in, in theatre and in um, some immersive and media um, technologies. That's kind of two-thirds of my life. And I have a, an advisory and academic life, including here at Ulster. So, so I'm from the industry and I've sort of crossed over a little into the academic world. Um, uh, and so um, we, we put forward um, a bid into the, what's called Wave 1 of, of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. And it was very quick, extremely challenging to do. Um, and um, we felt we probably wouldn't get any money on the grounds that traditionally the creative industries doesn't really get any money. Um, and the initial wave of announcements from the government involved ministers wearing hard hats and day glow at various places that were going to do batteries or cars or lots of very important and useful things, but probably not what we do. Uh, because we did find ourselves, and I'll say this because it's a room of friends, we did find ourselves coming again, up against the usual creative industries problems from policymakers, which I define as the when are you going to get a proper job um, <laughs> problem. Um, which I'm fond of explaining to civil servants, I can come to my big house in Sussex and we'll have that conversation. Um, so, um, um, so that conversation did occur. The other conversation which occurs is the, but isn't this all just subsidy for lovies conversation, which still happens. And then the one that, when you're no, you know you're nearly there, you get the, yes, but these are all made up numbers really, aren't they, conversation. So we fought our way through a set of hurdles with strong backing from certain parts, of government, including parts of the, um, uh, the, the, the national devolved um, governments um, and also from various bits of, of um, the department um, that, that sponsors our, uh, our work, the uh, Bays and the Department of Culture. Um, and crucially, from the Creative Industries Council, from the Creative Industries Federation, from industry bodies like PACT, who are very active here, and know from um, um, uh, the Games Associations, etc. Um, and slightly to our colossal surprise, um, we got through into the final stage and we, we got the grant. Um, and, 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 and what we put together was a, the, what, you're gonna, what we're going to talk about today, um, uh, a programme of work which is focused on um, actually how both the industries and the academics believe the creative industries work, which is around clusters of excellence, excellent skills, uh, I like to say anti-disciplinary, not interdisciplinary, collaboration that's about the job in hand not just about bringing together people from different positions, but that sort of collaboration. And, and our kind of final battle, when we thought we'd nearly won it, and we refer to this internally as, as the pig owl conversation, because I was in Paris working for Google at the time, because obviously I'm a lovey, really. Um, and, and, and we got a call that said, well, we think we're going to get the money, but it's got to be one big centre. Um, if you want sort of a chunk of money, they want one big centre. And this seemed to be driven by the fact that people, ministers like snipping ribbons um, on buildings. And we said, well, no, actually, that's not how it will work. So if, if you want one big centre, that's fine, but we won't do that because that will not work. Um, this is a distributed industry. It's a collaborative industry. It's got centres of excellence all over the country, including London. And there was quite a big push that sort of suggested everything should be outside London at one point. Um, and we then played the internationalist card back and said, well, there's lots of wonderful creative industries around the UK, but it would be a bit cutting off your nose to spite your face not to support what is probably the world's largest single creative industries cluster, the exception maybe of New York. Um, so, so we got a balance um, of um, uh, uh, the programme through, and it can be up to eight clusters. Um, and the other crucial piece of it was we were focused absolutely on the relationship between industry and higher education in the locations that are concerned, on things that are, that are special, the skills or the challenges that are, uh, are faced by those locations or those clusters are very specific to that location. Um, and, and that was quite an interesting, this is, it is, I think, quite an interesting way of approaching the, the opportunity. I know that challenge funding is very voguish for those of you who work in the kind of academic field at the moment. It also happens to probably work in this area, I think, in that the industry people we talk to in these workshops and elsewhere respond to the specificity of the idea of a challenge that might turn into money quite soon or might turn into interesting opportunities quite soon. 
So it's about clusters, it's about challenges, um, but there are, if you like, kind of strategic sort of architectural aspects to it as well. So what I've been fond of saying that, uh, uh, as I've travelled around the country doing these events is a, a really, a, a true cluster, a cluster that is actually a cluster rather than a, a, a funding construct. And we'll come back to the idea of funding constructs later because they're not going to win. Um, a true cluster has a past, a present and a future. In that you can look into the place, you can look into the activities of the cluster and you can see what it has done and you can see how what it has done, what's been culturally or creatively or, and or economically important here is still driving what happens today but is being changed or could be changed or could be inflected differently so that the cluster has a different, bigger, more successful, more culturally or socially cohesive, lots of um, possible benefits in the future. So you have to be rooted in the past. You have to be, it has to be true now and it has to be able to grow into um, um, something which can only happen because we make a significant investment and that the investment is in turn supported locally um, by industry, by government, by the various players that are in the cluster. So it was, it was quite a challenge to get this thing through into the creative industries. Um, but having done one, we thought we'd go for another. Um, so we are currently in the middle of the final stages of a wave two bid which might even be some more money on a very specific set of activities around immersive technologies and their potential in the UK. We haven't got that yet. We are still negotiating and there is a deadline today, which might mean I'm on my phone a bit, as we try to land a kind of, wouldn't be an, it won't be just an adjunct to this programme, but some aspects of, a, of an additional large-scale investment in the creative industries. If we land that, that will amount to about 120 million, 130 million invested in the creative industries in R&D in collaboration with universities, which is utterly unprecedented um, um, in, in this country and in most countries outside of Asia, actually, for that scale of funding to come into this, this, this sector in this way. So that's your context. I'm going to come back later and talk um, some more in the, in the programme briefing about the detail and the whys and the wherefores and what do we mean by some of those things. Um, but it, 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 that's the context we're sitting in. It's, it's, it's quite large-scale stuff for our sector, now, I appreciate you can probably buy one MRI scanner if you're a medic for the entire programme's budget, um, but this is different. Um, this is activities about bringing together talented people in context of really interesting opportunities that they think they can solve um, and turning that into um, uh, increasingly successful creative industries activities in places. <coughs> Now, what do I think about, about Northern Ireland? So this is my home away from home. I have a, um, a professorship here um, with the um, guys at um, Ulster, um, and uh, I know a lot of uh, you guys are in the room. To clear this for a moment, I chair this programme. I have a professorship here. I have no role in the decision-making process. I'm completely sealed from the decision-making process. That is peer-reviewed in the traditional academic way, but by a peer-reviewed group that includes industry people from the UK and abroad and academics from across disciplines. So if anybody wonders about my conflict of interest, I wonder about that more than you do, um, and I am clean and clear um, deliberately from that position. I have also no active role in the development of what's happening here in Ulster, just to make doubly sure. Um, um, but what do I think you've got as an opportunity? I think you're, there really is a cluster here both in terms of deep roots into um, textiles, deep roots into craft skills, um, deep roots in media, um, and as um, Paul Moore, my great friend from the university, just said, heavy engineering's becoming software engineering here, uh, and there's already a, a pivot going on in certain parts of the economy. So there are roots here. There's extraordinary activity already. You know, we're not very far away from, um, I don't need to tell you, you know, they hear the fact that Game of Thrones is made here, you know, in the rest of the country. They know that's really exciting and amazing. Um, and, and the heritage um, aspects of cultural tourism here, Titanic Quarter, um, and Eskillin, there is a, a big thing here. And there is an extraordinarily important connection to the South, um, which will only become more important, obviously, economically, politically, and, I, and I'm sure culturally. And there are also particular challenges here around the nature of the communities, the, the extraordinary cultural challenges that exist here and the steps that have been taken, you know, up in Derry, at the City of Culture, etc., that prove that culture can impact and activity in the creative industries can really impact societies in a significant way. So um, I think it's a really interesting opportunity for this part of the world. 
I also think the universities here do extraordinary work in different ways, and I'm hoping, and I, I'm hearing that everybody's um, um, working together, but that's um, a really important part of this. There are different disciplinary strengths. There are different ways of collaborating together. Um, so I think it's an extraordinary um, opportunity. Uh, I, I think and I know that our, polit your, our political masters are listening to the opportunity, um, and so I think that it is very timely that you're here. Uh, so thank you for coming. I'll be on and off during the course of the day. Um, that's some context for you. And now I'm going to introduce our first um, keynote speaker, um, who is um, Dr. Moya Doherty, who doesn't, Moya doesn't really need a lot of introduction. Uh, I won't oversell her. Um, um, Moya, um, of course, um, honorary doctor at, at, here at uh, the University of Ulster, uh, creator, founder, genius behind Riverdance, um, independent television producer, and of course now the chair of RTE. So uh, it's a great privilege that you've come and joined us, Moya. Thank you, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to colonize this space by putting my water there, <laughs> by taking my coat off. Um, I've really, truly just been a practitioner in the space, uh, propelled into it, buried in it, subsumed by it, dragged across the globe by it. Oh, thank you. Um, it's great when a man takes your coat. Um, and. Uh, I've never really had much time to reflect deeply on it. So it's actually curious to come to the reflection from the perspective of having done it, having been in it. Um, I, I, I think it's just probably nice to start with a little visual this morning because the world I work in is truly very visual. And I have a, a video clip here that was uh, of a major production we produced in Crow Park in Dublin um, in the early part of uh, 2000 for the Special Olympics. The Special Olympics came to Dublin. Um, it was the first time it was produced out of North America and we were asked to produce it. And so I think that it just gives an example of the breadth and depth of all the different disciplines involved. Now this is going back, this is dinosaur age now because I mean, the, all the, the talk this morning is, is, is virtual reality, and it's, it's fascinating. None of this existed uh, when we produced this program. But I just want you to just sit back and enjoy. The screen is a little bleached out, but um, if we get the sound going, I'll press the button, maybe. And here we go. I first saw in 1995, it was a gala performance, and I stood in the wings that night, bedazzled, moved, and proud to be Irish.
as you can imagine, a production like that was truly collaborative and gave many a heart attack along the way. Um, it's, it's interesting for me because uh, the idea that um, became a global phenomenon, started small, started in public service media, started, costed, it costed 17,000 pounds that I actually went to government to get. I had a clandestine meeting with the then Minister for Finance, a one Bertie Ahern, who since became famous for bringing the country to its knees in the <laughs> banking crisis. Um, but he gave me 17,000 pounds, and uh, that was what the original six minutes and 40 seconds cost. Now, obviously, that was the, you know, not the total cost, because OT had set and the orchestra and everything, but that's what it cost to commission the music, to commission the dance, the choreography. Um, and even though the show is reaching its 25th year, and I, I say this because of the, 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 what is so fabulous and fascinating about this industry, is that uh, it's always moving. And an idea, even an idea now that's been 25 years around, has a richness and, and a newness about it because we're entering into new ideas. We're currently working with um, an animation group out of the UK and Montreal on an animation story using the great Irish elk and the river dance music and dance. And it's a beautiful story and we're developing that and having, having um, a presentation next week in Dublin. But also we've I think the legacy piece for River Dance for me, the important piece is the education piece. So what we've started is uh, uh, summer academies. This we linked up with Trinity and we linked up with Boston College this year. And we've had 400 students from around the world come and learn not just about dance, but about our culture um, and about all the, the discipline, the discipline that it takes to be a dancer is the same discipline that it takes to be a runner, a footballer, uh, and anything. And if you apply that discipline to the broad creative in industries, it's, it's a marvelous thing. And now what we have, the, the benefit of, is some dancers who danced with us 25 years ago or 23 years ago are now running the business for us. They toured for 15 or 20 years, they're now in running the business. They're going to energize it, they're the future of the business. So it's wonderful that they can have a job and a role as a professional dancer and then move into production, direction, uh, animation, creation, innovation. Um, so moving on from my own story, uh, I suppose, just given the audience here today, it um, it's probably is worth reflecting a little on, um, on the creative industries. I mean, one of my other great passions is poetry. Um, and often many of the poets who were actually inflicted on us, inflicted on us at school are those which stay with us through, um, through adulthood. And I often think of the Henry Reid poem. I don't know whether any of you remember it, the naming of parts, the beautiful imagery of the gun, the assembling of the gun um, for the First World War. I think of it probably not so much um, as a poem, but as a reminder of just how important it is that we name carefully the thing that is most important to us. The bringing together of creative and industry has been central to the emerging recognition of this center in which we work. And of course, the realization that the worth of these industries is now in its billions has definitely helped us in the recognition, although I would concur with Professor Lilly, and we have it all the time with our own politicians. There's a lot of gob music, and when the budget comes, the numbers never follow. Um, the idea of the creative industries isn't new. Um, it was new to me, actually, but uh, not until I started a little bit of broader reading, I discovered that Theodore Adorno and Max Horheimer first coined the term in 1947 with the essay, The Cultural Industry. I think there was already a clear understanding that under monopoly capitalism, art and culture had become thoroughly absorbed by the economy. This work triggered sustained research into questions of art, aesthetics, the relationship between cultural production and cultural consumption, and in the case of the UK in the 1970s, the debate about the nature of working class life and community 
in an industrial age underpinned by technology and the mass media. Having a look again at some of this work, it seems to me that the key aspect which connected all of it was a kind of cultural criticism, an underlying conviction that art and culture were, were being commodified so that wealth could be generated by the very few. From the standpoint, I think, of the 21st century, this position seems elitist and somewhat patronizing. And certainly, it doesn't necessarily reflect adequately the complex contemporary industry where creativity, geography, and the self-start attitude can perhaps challenge traditional notions of commodified success. From my own experience, the contemporary position begins to formulate, fittingly perhaps, at the beginning of the new millennium. It coincides with the rediscovery of the city, the recognition of the post-Fordist economy and work cultures and awareness of a new urbanity, the rise and support of the small to medium-sized enterprises, and crucially, the recognition of the move from market-led economics to market-led economics driven by the globalization of economic activity. I suppose um, my own thinking on much of this has been gleaned and informed by two documents. One of them is probably now much maligned. It was, it was certainly uh, came through at the height of new labor. Chris Smith's 1998 book, Creative Britain, published when he was Minister for Culture at the newly formed Department of Culture, Media and Sport. It's been widely criticized for its apparent pragmatism, but from the vantage point, I think now of hindsight, it's this very pragmatism which has in its strength at the time where many uh, continually engaged in esoteric debates about definition. Um, so it is still really worthy of revisiting. And the second publication I found seminal has in many ways a direct connection to the Smith book. The Work Foundation 2007 document, Staying Ahead, the Economic Performance of the UK's Creative Industries. It was crucial for me since it produced a model which illustrated how the creative aesthetic could and should be turned into economic product without in any way undermining the conceptual authority of the maker. Um, and I think particularly now uh, in my role as chair of RTE, a document such as that is hugely important um, that we recognize the role of, I mean, RTE is in the Republic of Ireland, the single biggest um, employer within the creative industry sector. Uh, and there's this constant struggle because we're seen as news and current affairs. So on one hand, you're, you're biting the heels of the, your minister, and on another hand, you're going in seeking more funding. So the balance is tricky, very, very tricky. Anyway, um, this kind of rapid overview isn't, isn't a, doesn't mean to be in any way a sort of a history lesson, but to emphasize that the place where we find ourselves today has been actually hard won. I mean, I've just come from the creative industry launch across the way uh, at the Institute of the uh, Ulster University campus. And I've been involved with the university now for some time. And uh, I know that this venture has been at least 10 years in the making. 10 years spent informing, persuading, bullying, cajoling. Um, and I think that a venture such as that could really transform this city and this state. Um, the cultural quarters, I mean, in which this building is set, and it is truly a magnificent building. Uh, I think you have um, a lot more going for you here in this city than we have in Dublin. Um, but um, it's situated, <coughs> it has, it, it's developed against the backdrop of insecurities prompted by commercial exploitation of the work of commentators such as Richard Florida. And despite the new understanding of the importance of the creative industries, it's kind of still been quite difficult to convince uh, governments, as we said, for the need for investment in this sector, picking up again on what Anthony said. And I suppose though, it's important this morning that we thank the AHRC for having the foresight to work with the present government to ensure that this initiative could be a prominent part of the industrial strategy as expressed in the Industry Act. So the industry does owe you a great debt. I believe that this funding initiative is ground shifting for a number of reasons, as I see from the perspective of a creative industry practitioner. I think firstly, it is predicated 
on the establishment of proper industrial partnerships. I've seen many funding calls where the expression of industry was merely that, an expression. In this case, the funding will not be considered unless there's hard evidence of both industry input into the development and the evidence of formal partnership contracts. And secondly, the funding will be driven by challenges. <clears throat> unless the industrial partnerships are progressed fully, there will be little chance that the challenges will be real and effective for the region. This is an opportunity, perhaps for the first time, for the key industry partners to explain what they need and for the two universities in the region to find a way to deliver what is needed. And thirdly, doing so will allow academics to develop a more effective understanding of that concept which has caused them so much angst and indeed all of us impact. It is the challenges and the articulation of these challenges through work packages can be both framed and delivered, then the impact on this region will not be economic, but also crucially social and cultural. A successful creative industry sector in this region can and will undermine the binary culture of positions that have so long hampered its growth. And finally, the related underpinning work on research and policy will place this region and any region successful in its bid at the forefront of thinking on the creative industries and add a new paradigm shifting chapter to the debate that was started way back just after the war in 1947. I personally am particularly interested in the notion of work and the meaning of work in the 21st century. And I hope that this problem finds a place in the work of the AHRC and those who are funded by this scheme. I have been really fortunate to have had a fantastic journey in this industry. Um, it's allowed me the opportunity to experiment to innovate, to invest, to lead, to learn. Um, not only in, uh, in the least of all, as I mentioned earlier, in my role as chair of RTE. Uh, and that is the biggest challenge for me at the moment, is working with the new director general there, who has come from Discovery and the Turner Channel. First time woman in the job, uh, first time outsider in 65 years. Um, uh, to actually make the industry work, to find its voice, to find a place in the society that's not just buried in a backfield somewhere, uh, but that has real, true cultural meaning. Um, so I wish <coughs> all the clusters which emerge the best of success. And I think I'd like to finish now on a few lines from the poet himself, a man whom I miss as a cultural figure and an iconic figure. Uh, in my life, um, although his words will be forever with us. Um, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave, but then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. And most of all, believe in yourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Moya. Um, that's the first time anybody started and ended with a poet on these clusters. I, well, with the poet, in your case. I've got a, I've got a, 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 a that poet a quote for later that Paul told me. Look, that was so thoughtful and uh, inspiring and wonderful, and a combination, in many ways, a combination exactly of the thoughtfulness and the experience of the creative industries that I think characterize, will characterise successful activity here. So really, wonderful start today from the forest, thank you. Uh, nothing to follow, Phil, now, though, when we're following Moya. Um, so, um, Phil Morrow, we're going to do this as a little um, q and I think, aren't we? Um, Phil will be known to many of you. I first uh, met Phil back when we were working sort of in television and uh, yeah. packed and those sorts of things. Uh, very um, successful TV producer, Saturday night TV shows, big broadcasters, and now working in immersive and VR uh, areas as yeah. well. Um, with uh, Wild Rover before and, and, and the Retinize. company. Retinize, okay, great. So, Sorry, I'm a bit husky by the way, excuse me. He, he, he always says that. <laughs> um, 
So let's just explore. You know a little bit about this. I mean, we ask you to come yeah, up because you're an industry person and we want to know what it feels like from where you're yeah, sitting. Yeah, and I, 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 should, I should fess up that I come at this from a great degree of ignorance, uh, bearing in mind I only got the call last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start with that. And, uh, I like to think that's agile, flexible, creative industries behaviour. Yeah, right. but, I, but I think that there's some advantages because I want to ask, I'm, 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 I'm bursting with questions about how this is exactly going to work. I see. You know, I mean, I suppose I come with it. How short can we make this? Well, <laughs> we've got. Go on. So on, what, what sort of thing? Well, you know, I mean, speaking of, obviously a lot of this money is going into research. Yep. You know, most creative businesses on a day-to-day -day basis are worrying about survival, uh -huh. about getting commissions, about getting work in, and these kind of things. And while research is fantastic, uh, it, creating that causality and being able to put your time into it yep. is a challenge. Yep. And so, you know, it's great to say, what do you want? And this will give us our solution. Mm -hmm. But there's a ton of questions. What kind of research are we talking about? Yep. What, you know, how might this, how might this work to help you know, and, and, and I agree with everything Moy said. It's not just about pushing your business forward because this is not just about economics. Yep. Absolutely not. But at the same time, how do we, you know, uh, if you, I suppose I, I could take an example. The, the scientific thing is, you know, in, in the arts and culture, maybe there's the, the pure physics, which doesn't have an immediate yep. economic benefit, yep. but ultimately drives all of it. Yep. And in the creative sector, that's the same with a lot of the very early arts and creativity stuff that requires government funding and is central to is, is, is one of the driving engines of how we arrive yep. at an economic industry and that's the bit the government don't really understand yep. they, they, they think that's just lovelies but actually without that you have nothing yeah good sorry is that enough no that's loads um so where do you start with that so so it, you're right to put your finger on those questions because from an industry point of view many of them are traditionally barriers to engagement with higher education um, or, and or research. Yep. So there, there are multiple layers to this. And none of this is the right answer. These are just notions and ideas that we've been sort of playing around with. But some of them are built into the logic of the programme. So one thing, you may, if you're looking at bidding, uh, one of the unusual things about this call is you are able to fund in, uh, companies through it. You're able to, to fund industry partners through it, which for university people is not usually what happens. I'm always, I'm always watching Dylan here in case I say something wrong from the HRC side, but he's nodding at the moment. Yeah. I'm all right, yeah. Um, so, um, so it's possible. And, and by the way, and, and Moya had asked a really, I think, extraordinarily important question about what is work. And that also means what's a job. Yeah. And that also means what does it mean to be active in this industry? You know, because a colossal number of the people are not companies at all, or they're micro businesses, which is a term for person, um, yeah. or bank account. <laughs> um, um, so they're bank accounts that operate in a commercial way which fund people's lives. Um, so uh, piece one, it is possible to provide funding. How that is done is up to the, 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 the partnership. So we've talked you know, in other contexts about um, would it be interesting, I would have done this at a certain point in my, in my c career with a company, would it be interesting to be a fellow of somewhere paid for for three to six months to look at a research type problem that would feed into my, in, my, my company later? There were points in my career, and still are, where that would have been interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Would it be interesting to be able to do um, um, uh, sort of, um, and you and I have history on this, um, sort of placements yeah. um, where, where people can move more fluidly, early career researchers can move fluidly, people with postdocs can move fluidly into the industry. We can't fund the postdoc out of this activity, yeah. but for instance, I, I know this because um, one of Phil's um, um, sons uh, worked with me in a similar context once. Um, Yes, the answer is those sorts of things are interesting. Um, we can't fund the PhD bit, but if you happen to have some PhDs which could connect to the cluster, yeah. you would find very applied researchers. So that might be quite a long way out in sort of market terms. You're not going to get a product in a year. Yeah. But actually in VR, who the hell knows what product in a year is going to be anyway? Well, a very interesting question, though, for me, in terms of it, a lot of this is, you know, us getting our heads around it as, as creative businesses, yep. you know, is that innovation has tended to be driven by projects, by economics. In other words, we might spend some innovation money in development to try and do something in order to land a commission, or we might simply land a commission, not know how the hell we're going to deliver it, Usually, yeah. and then spend a lot of money trying to figure out how, how to do, do it. it you know? yeah. And so it's an ongoing, it, it comes from projects. Yeah. And one of the difficulties I think we have a lot of the time with big government initiatives is they 
the one thing they never talk about is, hey, let's make a movie together. Let's yep. make a VR thing together. Yep. Let's learn how to do this thing. You know, we're not, and, and it's very hard, I think, for creative producers to, to get think their, that way. Their, their, their mind around that process well, and putting a lot of time yeah. into something, because we're, we're, what we do is, it's we do things. projects. Yeah, that's well, that, we, I mean, that's, that's, that's our life. That's sort of what the challenge framing, not sort of, that is what the challenge framing is designed yep. to sort of construct an architecture for, a way of thinking about, because um, that's the equivalent uh, it's a way of driving the equivalent kind of mindset into the HE um, sector to some extent. So, I mean, I'll say this later, but, you know, this money, with the exception of there is a ninth investment, the Policy and Evidence Centre, which um, um, was mentioned, I think, a little bit earlier on, which is not uh, sort of one of the clusters. It's, an, it's about research. It's for research on the creative industries. These clusters have got to be research for and with the creative yeah. industries. So we're not looking for things in this call that are about measuring or new ways of impact or how to collaborate more effectively. That's got to happen in the projects. Yeah. In the same way that when you, you know, when I first, you know, one of my commissioners is in the room from when I did uh, one of my big first projects at Channel 4. We pitched it without the foggiest idea how we would do it technically. Yeah. And then it won a load of awards. But only because people stayed that. alongside us um, to do it. And, and, and so I, can, I can completely understand the sort of challenge idea. So... The industry um, and the sector bodies and the HE guys got to work together on what big challenges could be, such that sort of the little Russian dolls that sit inside the big challenge are actionable. Things that producers think they can get their hands on, or things that creators think they can get their hands on. Um, but and here's and I'll, uh, uh, here's an interesting thing that's happening in my my life at the, as a chair of this program. I meet two sets of people with with VC as their acronym. I mean, lots of vice chancellors <laughs> who sort of think this is not really traditional HE money because it's not the sort of thing they're used to. And I meet lots of venture capitalists who think it should all just be spent on getting companies to a point where they can then make five times their money out of them. And this is intended to sit in between, um, to try and link things up. And I sort of thought, and I do feel in it, uh, that if I'm slightly annoying vice chancellors, that's probably quite a good job description for what I'm doing. And I generally am always slightly an <laughs> venture capitalist yeah. in my life. So it, it's trying to sit in the middle. But it, nobody said this was easy. It's so, new stuff. I mean, a question about the research side of this. Yeah. And are we seeing this as only technical? No. No, we're not. So how broad is this? So, oh, um, so one thing it's not primarily is about the only cultural impact of an activity. So... Um, you know, a lot of universities in the arts and humanities space are very, very comfortable with libraries, museums, galleries, to some extent theatres. Now, this is not saying they cannot, it's not about those, because as you said, as Moya actually very clearly said and indicated, the subtle relationship between the sort of, the subsidised, which is actually the publicly invested part of the sector, because subsidy is a is a term designed to keep those institutions yeah. in dependency mode. The, sub, the publicly invested bit and the creative industries, but it's very interlocked and subtle. We both made a lot of money out of the BBC, which is broadly a publicly invested entity, which operates in a commercial landscape. As Moya said, RTE is the biggest employer in the creative industries Absolutely. in the South. Um, so uh, this programme is not primarily about those sorts of institutions, but if you can find a way of bedding them in and showing additional cultural and social value, as well as the economic and those pieces, then it absolutely um, can be. I think there probably could be cluster challenges about specific opportunities around certain technologies. Now, the, one of the reasons I told you there was another bid around immersive is that that's hot as anything at the moment. This is a lot of tech and immersive. A lot of tech and immersive. But actually, you said to me uh, exactly what I would have said to you when we were having a cup of coffee, which is actually big problems in immersive are not about tech at all. Totally. The big product development problems are about what is point of view, what is narrative. Yeah. Film directors hate it, actually, because they're control freaks and they like making every decision. Theatre directors and writers who operate in a way that's more fluid, which is totally. my world, like it. So one of the things we're looking at in that area, and I think we should all be looking at, is what does that mean then? Yeah. What's the cognitive science of that? How do you make big products that test that? I think that could be a cluster activity, but we don't want eight immersive no, bits. Sure, yeah. um, equally, high-tech fabrics... Craft industries playing into super expensive television being made down the road. Where does that go next? That could be interesting. I don't yeah. know, but they, they've got to be real. But we're imagining it could be across any university department. Yeah. You know, so this yeah. could be this could be a history project. It could be, yeah. a, a, you know, pure arts project. Yeah, I don't think it can be. You know, we've done this interesting research on 
the poet on Heaney and now we want to make a TV show. It's not that. No. It's not research in a television sense, in a sort of researcher gets you the facts sort of sense. But it could be inter interdisciplinary or antidisciplinary across departments. It should be. What we've said, I can't remember what the term is, it, it, it's got to be based in arts and humanities. Well, I said rooted in, but I sort of was told that was now not the term. I'm good with rooted. So rooted in arts and humanities, but effectively they've got to be interdisciplinary in academic terms. Right. In the same so way that in the you university are in production. it might be led by the arts and humanities department. Is that how you're saying that? I think so. I mean, uh, there needs to be a kind of. Uh, I'm doing all the talking. You're doing very That's well. That's all right. You can um, ask me whatever questions you well, want. Well, I will. But that, that it has to be led by a, a director who can come from industry or from the academic side. It's quite important to clock that. The yeah. PI, as you would think of it, doesn't need a research impact sort of list as long as your arm could be you. Hey, now yeah. I'm going to job interview you. Know? <laughs> if, you if you ran it, what would it do? What okay. sort of things are you interested in as an industry person that you know, are far enough out to be researchable? In you know, AR and VR and those areas. Well, I mean, the, the, there's, there's a huge number of questions in, 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 in VR to look at, you know, what, what is narrative language in VR and how... You know, this is one of the, the, the million-dollar questions: yeah. is how to how to how to develop that language and to work on a project where you could experiment with developing that language. Right. Uh, which, I mean, la language as it exists in VR is a really complicated subject because it's in the same way as in early film, people watching early films could never imagine modern feature films uh, because language is an emergent process between sure. between consumer or viewer and creator. Right. And uh, but. One of one of the issues you have in, 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 in VR, for example, is simply the ability to iterate fast, right. because uh, the, the customers haven't arrived yet. So the the, the investment isn't. So in the a piece of that is access to technology, but yes. not necessarily no. Tech? It's, no, it's, it's using the technologies is certainly central to it. But actually, it's about learning the creative lessons that we're more interested in. I mean, the tech will and is developing. And uh, new things are coming every day, and there's certainly plenty of tech projects we could come up with for people. So, who who would be yeah. in the room on that project? If we if we let's hypothesise a team um, of the kinds of brains, the kinds of mindsets. I'd like to work with the like. drama department in a uh -huh. in a university. I'd like to work with the with. I'd like to talk about what set design is in in, in three sixty spaces. I'd like to talk. You know, all of these things as well as the technology and capture aspect of it, you know? Okay. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different departments you could you could put in a project like that. And and science-y bits, sort of testing the oh, the way that the, the, the viewer is, or the player is experiencing this thing? People uh, doing that? You mean as in as in a measurement of where people are looking, heat maps, all this kind of stuff? Absolutely. All that information we don't have enough of, nowhere near enough of. And what, uh, what would come out of a process like that long term? Would we, I mean, one of the sort of architectural questions for this programme is not just how you do this programme, it's how this programme changes the way the universities, for instance, um, put undergraduates and, and master's level and doctorate people into the, into the industry. Do we need, I mean, I, I think we do, but do we need more of those people with those sorts of skills coming straight in now? Absolutely we do, but it's a bit chicken and egg in, in immersive because... There's not the money, there's not the jobs yet, but we think the jobs are coming. Right. You know, so the question is, can someone, let's let, one of our problems as a business is trying to get ahead of the market. You know, in other words, this market is coming, Goldman Sachs is saying it's going to be an $80 billion business by 2025. Uh -huh. So how do you establish position when there's no one you can go to, no broadcasters yet, really? I mean, very tiny amounts of activity. He'll say, here's some money, go and make this. Yeah. So how do you, you know, so our, our day-to-day problem is how do we make more stuff? Because those that iterate the most will learn the most. So isn't, and I know you've always been this sort of person, but isn't the, one of the questions back from the universities to the companies is, we appreciate your short-term demands, which sometimes yeah. are needs or requirements, yeah. but you've also got to help us think longer term yeah, so that absolutely. actually the cluster can develop over time, your companies can get the people you need? We are 100% into those kind of collaborations, and wherever we can work with people who have an interest and who want to develop all the... the there are so many new parts to this in terms of you know how you become ready to be a, a center of excellence for vr let's say uh, and all the different pieces of that jigsaw puzzle that range from computer coding all the way through to theater direction to art direction etc etc so what what's, what would be special to, to also understanding feedback on the on, on how people are viewing it what people are doing with it all how these it works. kind of questions i mean it's it's very multifaceted and what would be special about doing that here 
or, or doing any kind of creative activities as a cluster in this particular location? Well, why are you, I mean, I know you're here because you're from here, but yeah. you were also in London for a long time. And, yeah, and so why enough, you, what's a, special that, about that here? That brings me to another question, really, because, I mean, obviously we're very committed to here and there is a very active creative uh, cluster building up within the sort of uh, uh, immersive media. Um, all kinds of skills, and I think we have a pretty good broad range of skills beginning to build. Again, slightly crippled by lack of finance. Sure. But I think, I mean, first of all, obviously, one in, from a technical point of view, there's a lot of crossover between film and TV, and particularly high-end and VFX and all of these things that feeds very nicely into the immersive media. Yeah. Uh, as well as we have quite a well-established gaming and, and, and web industry here as well. So, you know, all of these skills come together in VR in a very exciting way. And I think, you know, because because we make some very big productions here in the TV world, Game of Thrones being obviously the most notable one, yeah. there's, there's a big skill base to draw on here. But also, I think we can do it a lot cheaper, let's be honest, than you can do it in London. To try and do this in London would be very expensive. I don't think I could be doing what I'm doing. Because of the early right nature now. of it. Yeah, because well. of the early nature of it. So, right. um, But at the same time, we have a very, cl my company has a very close relationship with the University of York. We've got two KTP uh, people working for us. Um, I don't know if people knowledge transfer partnerships yep. through Innovate UK. Okay. Um, and uh, because they had, they were doing particular research into storytelling in VR that was very tied in with what we wanted to do. And uh, that's been an incredibly fruitful and productive. Uh, Rory here, in fact, is one of the people. Okay. Just, Where's Rory? Hello, Rory. Yeah. Mm. We'll talk to you in a minute. We'll find mm. out about you. Um, that's a worry, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, so just to close then, that because I did know that, but I, w I wanted you to raise it, not me. So, how how what what from the from subject to Rory being in the room, from what you've learned from the knowledge transfer partnership, how do we do it better even in this program? How do we make this program do the things that you're getting bon the positive out the KTP thing? even better or bigger or how do we get more and how do we get more people from the industry to realize the benefits it's a really interesting question um i don't know if i have a an easy answer i mean certainly the ktp was an extraordinary amount of paperwork uh, right. which is not what we're good at as producers so um uh, and and the fantastic thing about university of york is they did 80 percent of that right and that was really helpful and it really accelerated the whole process they were they held our hand at every stage so a kind of light process for working with the cluster yeah because on a day-to-day -day basis you know particularly in things like new immersive media i mean tv some tv companies obviously have a few big projects going and they can they can set aside a certain amount of time yep. to do other things. And in a sense, that's kind of what I'm doing with immersive media because obviously I have a TV, You've still got TV yeah. as well. Yep. And uh, that brings in a certain amount of revenue, which gives me a certain amount of freedom. But broadly speaking, particularly in the micro entities, even more people are literally trying to pay the rent every day. And so, you know, months and months of form filling and paperwork and, and meetings and things, yep. meeting with lots of other people who are on full time salaries, yeah. uh, working <laughs> for their organizations is always very frustrating. Yeah. And then do they try and own all the intellectual property? Uh, sometimes. I mean, again, that's another bun fight, and then you have to pay a lawyer and all these kind of things. You yeah. Know? I mean, there's, there's plenty of hurdles here, you know, yeah. that we need to cross. Yeah, because there, there are some sort of interesting assumptions in, deeply buried in the call document for this, which you're not expected to read, thankfully, but about not doing that if you're the yeah. higher education organisation. I was also going to say that, you know, we're incredibly committed to Northern Ireland, but we're also not... Insular, you know, I didn't sit in London and think when I li lived there and think I can only work with London people And I don't think that here. God bless everyone here. Fantastic But you know, we've always been a global company. We yeah. have a global perspective. We've worked a lot in LA. We've worked a lot in London We've got shows on all over the world, you know, um, I just I, I While it's fantastic to have people nearby you can meet up with and do things with I think it's a very insular notion that we're just yeah It's an interesting question that isn't it somebody asked me I can't remember where we were um, I think in Manchester, it is, is there a kind of diameter? Do you, can you put a sort of compass on the map and then if you, you set it out and you draw a circle around the centre of the cluster and if you're not in that, you're not in? And I thought, mm, there's no easy way of answering this nicely. Of course there isn't. I mean, you have to make an argument because in a way, the geography is, is kind of, it's like a version of a supply chain. Yeah. You're working within a cluster, but also you're working out elsewhere. And you wouldn't keep somebody out of being involved in a cluster because they were expert in another world, another part of the world, but really working closely with you. And that, that would be odd, wouldn't it? But also in the modern tech industry, to have geography as the limiter Defined, seems yeah. absurd. It's a challenging one, isn't it, though? Because, you know, the creative industries and the cultural industries impact on regeneration in cities, 
yeah. there are pros and then there are quite rapid cons to gentrification and all those sorts of topics. Yeah. But actually, you know, there, there is quite a lot of evidence that you know, geographic-based, place-based in the jargon and activity has a big impact. And we're involved in that and committed to that too. I'm just saying it's not, but not, just. It's not the entire picture. Yeah, I think, well, uh, that was sort of our argument in getting the clusters as a framework rather than just let's build one and then cut a ribbon. Yeah. But it was also our <laughs> argument in... You'll read subtly in the document, it, it sort of says they'll have a relation, uh, part, the partnerships will have a relation to place, but it isn't, you know, unless yeah. you're in here. The other thing they're not, and this is something I think you said to me earlier, is, and we'll come to this quite a lot today, is it's not just about a bunch of academic institutions kind of um, constructing a funding structure. So for academic people in the room, I chaired the Doctoral Training Partnerships Programme for the HRC as well which is broadly that. It's about getting the funding to work across the system. This is about laser-sighted investments in places where it can work. And it isn't primarily about, well, we've had this many HRC grants. Yeah. It's not that sort of money. So because, and, and because industry people have got to be in the room. So if there yeah. were to be a cluster here, you'll get a call from somebody, and it'll be me if it's not somebody else, that fantastic. says, OK, yeah. what is your role here? Are you on the board of this thing? Are you in, a, are you in the advisory group? How do we get you in? Because the decision-making has to work in parallel. You know, because if an industry, if a, if a challenge comes up from the industry side, it then is sense-checked against the academic together in one room. If it comes up from the academic side, it's sense-checked against the industry and it doesn't work. We probably would be more likely to know than we would have been five years ago when we assess yeah. it. Can we I ask another people. question? Yeah, and then we've because got finished, I know, yeah, yeah. We're done, which is basically, how, how, how is success measured in this? God, you look good, aren't you? Um, <laughs> so there are a number of answers to that, one of which is um, about the, the need to match the measures against the challenges. So what there will not be is a kind of, there will be some programme level me measurement, but what there will not be is a kind of one-size-fits-all approach to dreaded KPIs, etc. Um, and you, uh, we're, we're evolving that as we go along, which again is uh, exciting slash uncomfortable yeah. <laughs> for a funding, for, for a research council. Um, um, but it, it won't be just traditional success, me success measures. We've also made it clear in these events that when the, the, the kind of initial challenge proposal comes in, we won't then say in four or five years' time, oh, well, actually, a million years ago, in a world before we knew what virtual reality was, you said you'd do this. And now you haven't, because the world has entirely changed yeah. in the meantime, but you said you would do that. We won't say that. So we're going to be flexible. We're going to try and be much more flexible than we have been. That said, um, if it all doesn't work, I shall be in front of the Public Accounts Committee dealing with £85 million pounds of wasted money, which... It's not something I'm really penciling in the diary. At and all by the possible. way, they're putting the money in because they want economic growth. Yeah, they are. And, that and, is and their it's, goal in the It's end. a challenge, isn't it? Because it's hypothecated. It's money with a job. You know, um, Alex Vincent, who's the, the SRO for this um, from HRC, who couldn't um, be with us today, she says it's not got strings attached, this money. It's tied on with ropes. <laughs> um, and so we might as well know that. It's got a job to do. But it can do that job in various ways. In, and it can do it in various timescales. So the answer is we need to be flexible about it. But I, I don't think, for instance, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm not the decision maker in the end, I don't think it will be you said 14 jobs and there were 11. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be that, because I don't know what job is in that, in that sense. But I think... It's an interesting question. <laughs> your, your, your job, is, the, the kind of task is to be able to say, here's the challenge, and because the challenge is bespoke to us and it's interesting and new, here are some ways we think we should measure it. And then we've got to work out whether that's true enough for the individual cluster. And then we've got to worry about the programme level whole thing, uh, measurement. So it sounds, it's, I'm either being flexible or evasive, and I'm not sure I know what the difference is yeah. in this particular moment. No, I think we're being flexible um, as best we can. So yeah, it's going to be measured, but it's, it, it will it not the be measured. The that will be design. in the projects that get greenlit, really. It genuinely will. You know, it genuinely will. Um, and it, it, it is one of the areas about this whole programme that is, it's sort of like being on, on a surfboard to some extent, trying to sort of measure, work it out. Why we've done these events, why we're doing this process in steps, is for people to be able to say, this is the sort of thing we think. What do you reckon will work? And then we can start thinking, well, who do we need to assess all these then at peer review, which we've started? Because yeah. if you get the wrong people in that room, you get the wrong answer. Um, and then we've got to think about, and how are we going to make the decisions? And that will lead us into sort of measurement um, down the line. Yeah. Um, I think that's how it works with an investment, by the way. That's what my VCs at the venture capital end are like. 
they say, here's your business plan, and they say, we think that's credible, because we, like, we think yeah. you can do it. We think it's an interesting market. We know you've worked it out. And then they go, now we're going to tear it up because it's all nonsense. Well, you know we've made it all That's up. roughly exactly what happens. It's roughly exactly yeah. what happens in every VC. They go, yeah, you're okay, great idea, good market, you've thought it through. Throw it away and we'll start again now. And then they work on, or they keep with you every three months. Yeah. Or more regularly. They don't yeah. come back four years later and go, now what happened to this KPR? So I think we want to try and take more of, a, more of that agile, flexible, you know, where the data is, is kind of a, it's sort of a, a benefit of the programme rather than the thing done to you at the end. Yeah. Um, but that's hard, I know. It's, it's really, really exciting, I must say. Yes, yeah, hard. I mean, it is really exciting if we can figure out ways. The, the difficulty for producers, I say again, is, is if you find yourself lost in the abstract. Yeah. Because, you know, if you ask me as a TV producer, what do I need to sell a new television program? You know, you know? and the answer is a great idea, great talent, a commissioner with some money, you know? I mean, Timing. Yeah, and, ti and timing, obviously, uh, but and a, and a great team, whatever. But, you know, if you suddenly ask me, what will I need in 10 years' time or five years' time that we can develop our way towards? Is, yep. uh, you know, is some new camera going to get me a new show? Probably not. No. You know, is, you know, would I rather spend the money in commissioning writers? Would I, you know, it's a, it's a slightly difficult sort of... It is. But it's quite a Head luxurious. For us it, to get isn't it quite a luxurious it? opportunity for yeah, the people absolutely. who are interested? If they're not interested because they're trying to do it in the next six months, yeah, yeah. and they have to, then that's probably, that's probably not right for them. Every business should be doing both. I should be looking right. after the next six months and the next five years. You know, that's a good exit line. Thank you very much, Phil Moore. Let's have a cup of coffee. Uh, note to self, I don't normally give this bit of the session, <laughs> so this is me doing somebody else's slides. So Dylan uh, is mic'd and Sumi is wherever, over there, is mic'd from the HRC in case um, specific questions come up. I'm going to rattle you through uh, a presentation that um, uh, Professor Andrew Chitty, who is the HRC's creative economy champion um, and is um, effectively uh, working with um, clusters, um, potential bidders, in more detail than I do, because uh, he's better at it, much, much better at it. Um, who uh, Andrew normally gives this uh, section of the of the morning, um, and um, you'll come across him um, as uh, as uh, you progress down this journey. So, um, just to sort of pop through, um, I said earlier on we, we started um, uh, bidding into the government's um, industrial strategy challenge fund. Um, a billion pounds in this particular round. It comes to four point something in the end. Four point seven, we think, um, in total. And the initial sort of round of, of successful uh, sectors were, as it says there, things like healthcare, medicine, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, autonomous vehicles, um, other kinds of autonomous vehicles for uh, um, complex and difficult environments for which read oil and gas exploration, etc. Things you would sort of expect. Um, uh, all of interesting, um, not, no, in no way uh, um, disrespecting what they're up to. Um, um, and then we drove, uh, carried on working through until the creative industries uh, became part of it, Pharma pharmaceuticals uh, part of it, as you'd expect. And then uh, we, we came to sort of put forward, and Moya showed us video of the, uh, the opening ceremony that they did. This is obviously um, Danny Boyle's uh, totally extraordinary fusion of art, creativity, and genuine insanity that was the opening of the 2012 Olympic Games. Um, um, we were beneficiaries of the technology that made those um, chimneys when I, was, uh, when I uh, was at the English National Opera. They're pneumatic. They're like hot air balloons that open at incredible speed. We had to make a 22-foot high golden statue in 2.7 seconds um, um, whilst in full view on stage. And that's what you use it for. Extraordinary technology, incredibly difficult, quite expensive, came from an R&D process on a large public uh, event um, 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 initially. So what happened um, three Fridays ago, about three weeks ago today, is it? Four, three. Yeah, yeah something like that, was that this man, who is the Right Honourable Greg Clark, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and the Industrial Strategy, um, launched this programme um, um, as part of um, the, the, the work that Sir Peter Bazalgette has been doing, uh, reviewing the creative industries, which is in turn part of the work towards a creative industry sector deal, as they're called. Um, and um, um, we believe that, the, well, we don't believe, we know that the creative industries will be one of the first sectors to have a kind of rebalanced um, sector deal with the government. We are expecting, but we don't know what they'll be, a number of announcements in the budget, which is mid to late November. We don't know what any of them will be. There may be none of them, of course, by then, but lots of people are discussing possibilities for the budget um, and beyond. 
Um, people in this room will know there is, uh, that there are, there's almost an industry in doing snazzy graphs that show the size of the creative industries in the UK. Um, this is one of them. Um, there you are. <laughs> I'm not going to read it out because you're all literate human beings. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, we, we have got through the, the kind of arguments to a large extent, although you know, there tends to be a sort of undertow of, yes, but you would say that, wouldn't you, about the data. Um, um, but there is a lot of data about the scale of the industries, and it is becoming increasingly accepted. One of our logics, not our logics, the logic to some extent, of setting up the Policy and Evidence Centre, which is the, the other part of this programme, which has a separate call, which is running in parallel-ish with what we're doing here. Um, uh, that centre is, uh, is about research um, on the creative industries and data and, sh and data sharing and collaboration around data. One of the, the, the logic of that, to some extent, is to really set in stone the fact that there is genuine hard data, that it is measured and um, dealt with in a fully rigorous, independent and authoritative way um, so that we have a foundation to continue building on and so that we know whether any of this is working. Um, as much as I love the creative industries working in it, much as I love the policy of it, having played in it, if what we do doesn't work, I'd rather we knew. Um, so there's a snazzy graph. Here is another snazzy graph. Um, this is um, Creative Industries Co. UK. This is the CIC, I think, the Creative Industries Council, looking at employment. 2.9 million jobs in the, across the UK. One in 11 UK jobs. If any other sector had one in 11 UK jobs and was still persuading the government that it was interesting and important, well, end the sentence any way you like. Um, there's an interesting UK map there, which you will note has Northern Ireland at a relatively small percentage of proportion of jobs in the UK creative economy by region. That's percentage of the UK. It's not um, um, percentage of Northern Ireland. So some of these regions skew in rather odd ways because of where the cities are, etc. We'll come back to that. Um, and some of this comes out of a Nesta report, um, uh, the Geography of Creativity, which started to, well, which, which built on previous work that the authors, um, Hassan Bakshi um, and um, Juan um, Garcia, who works with Hassan, had already done on clusters, which identified again a, num a number of um, um, uh, clustering behaviours and uh, um, um, data and evidence around the country. Um, no different piece of work identifying the same sort of clusters was uh, this piece, Tech Nation, which was predominantly focused on the digital side, the digital tech industries, but also played into the, 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 the relationship between the digital industries and the creative industries to some extent, and under, underpins uh, the, the nexus between the digital, creative, digital industries, creative industries, the, the, the fuse, as it's called in HRC, um, because of research projects done in Brighton and the northeast of England and elsewhere, um, and activity that I know has happened here with an ice screen looking at these, these, these companies, rather like the ones, frankly, that I founded 20 years ago where we didn't know that's what we were doing. It's just we had to have the right people in the room to do digital media and nobody invented the word yet. Um, the, the kind of fused companies that combine together creative, digital and information technology, CDIT in, in HE parlance and government parlance. To somebody from the industry, this is kind of obvious stuff because this is how you built companies, but it's great to see the evidence coming through. Um, Nesta looked at specific clusters um, in the UK. It's a bit blown out, that, isn't it? Um, um, but it shows you um, um, major um, areas of activity, and pleasingly, uh, we have one here, um, which is uh, um, shown on the data. And we've been doing some more work, and it's now been published, hasn't it, this? Um, additional data following up this data to, to um, dig in um, uh, to, to the data on clusters in more detail. So Nesta's work found... What's a cluster? It's a geographical con concentration of creative businesses and workers, quite often linked to value chains, for instance, around a major uh, commercial entity. It might be the BBC, might be government, actually. It might be uh, an advertising agency that's got a great deal of um, suppliers around it. could be a games company, um, etc., uh, or a, a cluster of those companies. Um, clusters, and it's interesting terminology, this can often include other institutions, such as higher education institutions can often include means doesn't always, or might not. Um, I think it does here, actually, but there are parts of the country. We were in Manchester the other day. It's a very interesting um, creative industries cluster in sort of Cheshire with no obvious HEI connection to it at all. 
So one of the things to be really careful about is not imputing a connection between the HEIs and the Creative Industries Cluster if it's not there. Um, um, and, but it can include um, those, and also, of course, trade associations. And they're different sizes, these clusters, um, and different configurations. But in the middle of them is something about collaboration, um, inter-organisational collaboration. They could have spaces, they could have incubators, they could have studios, they might have none of the above. Um, but these are sort of characteristics. Now, we've done some new data, which I'm not going to propose to take you through on this screen at this distance, um, not least because the projector's not handling it very well, but showing you um, hotspots and um, not the creative industry. So if we look up into um, this part of the world, white means white's in the middle, orange uh, colours are at the um, intensive end, blue colours are at the not-so-intensive end. So there is activity here, but these are to some excuse by the balance of the economy in the region, as well as by... Um, the amount of creative industries activity. Uh, and that's why there's a difference between the um, business count and the employment numbers. So there are quite a lot of businesses in this part of the world, but they don't employ all that many people, which is what Moira Doherty said kind of earlier on. There may be lots of very small businesses. There may be lots of three- and four-person businesses. I think the median size of creative industries businesses across the country is three and a bit employees, and that includes the big ones factored in against it. Um, so it, it, it's interesting. That means there is, a, there, is a, there is somewhere to fish here, but they're possibly, it's quite hard fishing in the, the sense there are a lot of um, small entities to engage with as well as a limited number of larger entities. If you then dig into certain sectors, you'll find that this one, for instance, is TV, video. It's pretty hot here um, and hot in the southeast of England. It's sort of strangely um, cool in some places you wouldn't, excuse me, wouldn't think it would be cool in. Um, 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 so we've dug a little bit into deeper into sectors, and this data is available um, now, yeah? Soon, I think. Soon? Yeah, soon. I don't okay. Think it's, yeah. Somebody's going to tell me? Soon. Oh, okay. So this data is going to be available to inform the bid that you put forward and everybody's bids. It's partly for your purposes. It's actually partly significantly for ours in that we needed a baseline so that when those very difficult questions about measurement come back to me later, we've started, in so we've started somewhere. Um, but we're um, in, I think, another first for uh, a research council. We're opening up our baseline data to the bidders, um, certainly for the HRC. I've never seen us do it before. Um, but if you look at something like architecture, here's a really interesting one. Who knew that this was a hotspot for architects? You probably do. I don't know that. There are some very interesting hotspots for architects in Cornwall and Devon that you wouldn't necessarily assume if you were just looking at the aggregate numbers. And the reason for showing you this is that it, it indicates that there could be subsectoral clusters that might be invisible if you just look at the big numbers um, in a given geography. So it could be that, you know, if we dug into the um, fashion fabrics and fabrication side of things, we'd find a lot of activity. I don't know. I haven't done that. We'd find a lot of activity here. Um, there's a lot of activity in my sort of part, home part of the world, which is the northwest of England in that area, coming from a long tradition of cotton and in the case here of, of linen, etc. cetera. Um, crafts uh, indicate that. Oh, hello. My screen just went up. Crafts indicate that across the country. Um, I'm about to become a trustee of the Crafts Council. I'm interested in craft because I think it's a, um, I think it's both interesting as a sort of consumer. We buy and commission quite a lot of that sort of work. But also because it, it, it's the sort of meat and drink of it. It's the roots of a lot of the activity that goes on. It's creative industries, um, very clearly. Um, it's a big export business. Um, it is a, a, a significant part of the wider creative economy. But it skews rather interestingly, you know, of course there are lots of crafters up in the North and Highland Island of Scotland. When I think about it, it's just I didn't. Um, museums and galleries, very interesting. Northern Ireland figures in a big way in the cultural um, economy piece of this, and museums and galleries piece of it comparative to other areas of what um, uh, other parts of the country. Interestingly, again, the Highlands and Islands really figures. Um, um, and some of the big national museums that have outposts and big national cultural institutions that have outposts or national centres around um, the nations and the, and the regions of England also have a determinant effect here. But they're, you know, they're, 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 there's no big single cultural institution right in the far north of Scotland that is driving this. On the left of the diagram, but on the right of the diagram, there are lots of people employed in museums, galleries and libraries, which probably means museums and galleries, given the horrifying policy around libraries. Um, so that, that it's an interesting bunch of data. Advertising marketing is, is, is an interesting sector in the same way. Hotspot here, 
um, comparatively. Clearly, the metropolitan centres are very significant, but there are, uh, and I know it's true here, there are national and regional level significant centres of expertise and scale because they work in local markets and they work in national markets. You only need to walk through town here um, to see some of those um, 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 businesses. But they're not big employers um, in this part of the world. So these are just interesting nuggets for you. Uh, we did architecture a moment ago, where these are the Scots graphs, just because we're, very, we're really interested in what the hell is happening there and, and how the, 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 the businesses um, shake out in, um, in Scotland. What's going on with the projector, mm -hmm. by the way? Crafts are done, designed. So you can get the message. We have lots and lots of data you can share. Oh, we'll go back to that one. IT and software services. I was expecting Northern Ireland to come up higher on that than it does. Um, and if it comes back on the screen, we'll be able to see it. Um, I was really expecting Northern Ireland to come up higher. Um, and so it will be interesting to see what the, what the issue is. Is it a cable, maybe, um, with that? Because clearly there is a significant software cluster here uh, on some measurements, one of, the, one of the largest and fastest growing outside uh, the southeast, I, I believe. Museums and galleries. So you can look at all this stuff. I don't propose to talk to every single one of them. Um, and all creative industries look like that. So this guy is, um, is Sir Peter Bazalgette, referred to by his friends, um, distant acquaintances and enemies as Baz. Um, and um, he um, uh, did, did the review that I talked about earlier and, and talked very much about um, clusters um, in, the, in, a, in a larger scale. Um, he's advocating for an investment of a really colossal investment, a £500 million investment in clusters, of which our programme is it's not the pilot, because it looked like everything had been terribly well planned. I'll tell this, it's a room full of friends, but we were already sorted out before anybody decided this was a good idea at the sort of national policy level. Um, but the good news is that what we're doing is playing into a big policy narrative. His argument was that they play very well into regional growth and national growth, they in increase and improve productivity because they're about increasing what's already happening in a, in a dense cluster. And a big part of them is about talent and skills and thinking long term about the R&D pipeline, all of which is, is absolutely core to the thinking that we've been doing within this HRC programme. So we found ourselves by alignment, rather than having done all this in a very deliberate way, we found ourselves all in the same place in terms of alignment. It would be interesting for you to know that some of the people who are very aligned with us now wanted to have one big centre. They could open with some scissors. Um, but actually, everybody is coming to this position of this being a, a way of investing this funding. So the programme itself, and this is where Dylan's going to come up. Are you, Dylan? Sit with yeah, me in yeah, case. I'll, I'll take over. You're going to take over. So Dylan's going to talk you through a little bit of the specifics of the programme. Um, and, um, and then he'll be leading with the team uh, the work that goes on this afternoon in the bidders workshop. We'll see if they can, if, the, if our magician friend here can fix that. Okay, There's you. the thing. I shall go and sit there again. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay. So um, thanks, everybody. So I'm Dylan Law. I'm the strategic lead for this Creative Industries Clusters program. This wonderful thing. It means I've got overall kind of responsibility for trying to make sure this stuff actually gets done and goes through. Um, not just the call um, and the actual competition and activity, but also all the other stuff around sort of communications and... Um, finance and all of these kind of things. So, yeah, I, yeah. so um, it's, it's kind of on me if, if this is not going to work very well. So, <laughs> yeah, um, no pressure there then. Um, just like to say as well that, you know, if this screen sort of stops working, I will try and personify it through the medium of dance or mime or something <laughs> like that. So um, I'm going to try and keep it interesting. But to be honest with you, the things you've seen this morning, the keynotes um, and the stuff that Andrew's, uh, Anthony's been talking about, it's probably the interesting stuff. This is the really sort of quite prosaic stuff, but it's very, very important to make sure that you are aware of what's happening here. So you're going to have to bear with me a little bit uh, if, it, if it's a little dull. There's also quite a lot of repetition, you'll notice, as well. So there's, there's possibly two reasons for that. Um, one of them could be that this is the eighth one of these events that I've done, and I'm entering into some state of delirium um, <laughs> and starting to repeat myself a little bit and not even realising I'm doing it. So you can entertain that notion, but the other notion to entertain perhaps is that um, we are repeating ourselves deliberately in order to just kind of hammer home some of the real key points about the programme. So without further ado, oh, hang on, this has gone backwards. Yeah, that's what I did. Right, okay. So the Creative Industries Clusters programme itself then. So the idea behind this thing um, is um, the, ba the basic premise of it is to try and grow the creative industries, and we're doing that from, from the kind of um, focal point of the creation of exciting new products, services and experiences. 
And I think we're doing that because I think we think this is the best chance we've got to succeed with this programme, is to take that, that kind of focus. Um, we're also hoping that what this programme will enable us to do is also create a kind of robust creative R&D infrastructure. Um, I think in other sectors and other indi industries, is the, the, the concept of R&D and the idea about what that actually is, is is far more clear, whereas I think in the creative industries it could be any number of things, and indeed could be just constitutive of the entire act of creating something anyway, the, the concepts of R&D. So I think it's going to be interesting learning experience from us from the programme to see how that, how you know, what, what, what you can get out of that in terms of the kind of overall R&D landscape. Um, so in terms of the programme, um, We've got £51 million worth of direct funding um, from uh, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund to enhance connections between the creative industries, so that could be businesses within, that could be government sector, that could be trade bodies, any, any, anything like that, and also um, HEIs, um, and, and also um, independent research organisations, in fact. So what we're going to fund via that um, £51 million is up to eight creative R&D partnerships, which are, again, R&D focused to boost that activity between the creative industries and universities. But we're also going to fund a, a Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, or PEC. I mean, if you hear us talking about the PEC, that's what we're talking about there. We're not talking about pecking stuff physically. Um, we, our, our AHRC, uh, we're very acronym uh, keen on acronyms. We kind of live within this world of acronyms. So um, that, that, that's the PEC. We're not really going to talk about that one so much today because there's going to be a separate process that happens for that. Um, so we're really more focused on the, um, the creative R&D partnerships aspect of that today. We're likely to probably do another kind of engagement event around the, the Policy and Evidence Centre later on in the year, though. Um, so look out for that if you're interested. Um, so in terms of the, the, the programme itself, the challenge focus of the programme, I think um, the way that we've tried to go about this and the way we've articulated this in the call document um, is we've looked at a couple of things that I think we call kind of opportunities and threats. Uh, they started out maybe as market failures, but then we thought maybe they're not just all failures. Maybe they are actually, there is something in there that will enable us to actually do something really positive with this program. So those are the sort of things we're talking about there are things around sort of new business models, um, IP regulation, um, access to kind of investment and capital, the kind of long and short term skill shortages that really affect some of the industries. Um, and there's also, we also were aware of the fact that there are very particular challenges around equality and diversity in certain uh, aspects of the, uh, the creative industries or certain sectors. And then the big one around kind of collaboration, networking, access to the kinds of people that you might need to do in order to enable the, uh, the industry to grow. And I think you know, one of the other ones that kind of underpins that, then international trade, access to international markets and, and the ability to be able to export your products. Now, as you'll see from this neat little diagram, this Venn diagram, um, the, uh, the, the main one, the sort of first among equals in there is um, the, pro the concept of product and service innovation. I think that's the products and service innovation is the thing that we'd like to see central to all of these projects. Um, in terms of the challenges, it, it could be that the actual challenge that you articulate from your cluster, from your, you know, your sectors, um, could in, in, encapsulate any one of those kind of, or incorporate any one of those other challenges. But I think we really want to see this idea of products and service innovation as kind of central to our, everything that we're doing via this program. So, okay. I'll carry on anyway. Um, so the key aims of this program, there, therefore, are, are to enhance, what we're saying is enhance existing creative clusters. So what we're, not, what we're not looking to do here is kind of build a creative cluster on a greenfield site because we think it might be interesting. I think that in itself is an interesting idea, if we, but unfortunately I think with this level of funding, oh, that's, uh, that's not what we're talking about. Anyway, <laughs> but with this level of funding, um, we think that, although it seems a lot to us, it's a big program for us and it's a big injection of capital into the creative industries. In terms of actual amounts of money to be able to do something like develop a creative industries from the ground up, it's not actually going to be that much money. Um, so I think that we see our best chance of success with this program to actually enhance creative clusters that are actually there, that are actually in operation, that are actually delivering stuff, something. Um, so. Again, the way we're going to structure this is around the kind of HEI creative industries collaborations or partnerships, very equal partnerships as well. So they're not led by, by universities. The universities are a partner, an equal partner in the entire sort of endeavour. Um, and they're, they're, the fact that they are challenge-led focused, so that, you know, they have to be, the, the partnerships have to be developed around an identified challenge. Um, 
So again, the R&D partnerships uh, are there to provide kind of uh, R&D programs that address those specific challenges in those specific clusters. So we're not talking about something which is generally across the whole creative industries uh, via this program. Um, and also the ultimate uh, impetus of that is to step up growth and the impact of the creative industries in those places. Uh, again, there's a bit about the policy and evidence centre again, but we're not going to talk about that one today. So in terms of the... Um, Key feature of the R&D partnerships, and here comes the sledgehammer because this is where I start repeating myself, um, possibly deliberately, um, is again, we're, we're talking about the key feature of this program is connecting linking with existing creative clusters. I can't, can't stress that enough that we're not looking, you know, we, we're looking for you to use some of the data that we're providing and also you to be able to articulate um, why, you know, if you're putting it in a proposal, why you're working within one, a, a, a creative cluster that already exists. Um, we want it to be challenge-led in its approach. Um, and this, th this point I said earlier on, it, this is to be hosted by an HEI, but we're, not g we're going to use the term hosted rather than led. I think you need to see all of the partners that are involved in this program as being relevant to answering and responding to those challenges. So their role in it has to be absolutely clear, um, but also all of them have to have um, uh, be on an equal footing. So we're not looking for you know to be bringing in a bit of expertise from the side just to sort of help out with something. They need they need to be involved. All of the partners need to be involved in the kind of conception, the design of the project, and the delivery of it. Um, so we're also kind of looking at um, it being a, the multidisciplinary. I think the term Anthony used there is anti-disciplinary um, in terms of the fact that I think we're going to try and stay as disciplinarily agnostic as possible. Um, so what we want you to do is we want you to articulate the disciplines that need to come in to respond to the challenges and think of it that way around rather than thinking we're the Arts and Humanities Research Council, we're leading this, so therefore there has to be Arts and Humanities right up front. It would be delightful if there's loads of Arts and Humanities in this and we think the potential for Arts and Humanities researchers and uh, practitioners to, to work on this is enormous, um, so we're confident about that. Um, but we're not saying that there has to be a mandated minimum level of arts and humanities involvement. It is as appropriate to the uh, to the challenges that are being responded to um, as part of the uh, part of the partnership. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things, and I think this was sort of touched on this morning, and I think it's really interesting about this program is I think we're seeing it as a kind of dynamic thing. So we're, we're not going to um, say set out your store uh, when you put your application in, and we're going to hold you to that across the entire life of the program. We appreciate that obviously that this is a fast moving sector. Um, and also, this is a fast-moving process. We're having to deliver the money in an incredibly short amount of time. We're putting an awful lot of pressure on you to be able to deliver a proposal that's coherent and hangs together in a very short amount of time. So what we're actually saying is that over the first year of that funded programme, should you receive funding, then we will expect you to be able to work with all of the people involved in the partnership and sort of refine and sharpen and develop those challenges so that by the end of that first year, you'll have a really clear idea about exactly what those challenges are, develop from the initial overall challenge, um, and also how your R&D uh, programme is actually sort of tailored to be able to respond to those challenges. So in terms of identifying a challenge, I think we tried to think about, um, you know, we, we had a quite a few questions about, like, what do you actually mean by a challenge? Um, and I think we, so we had to think quite carefully about how, how do we actually direct people to actually identify these challenges. So I think the, our approach to this is that the challenge, it needs to be defined by the needs of the cluster of which you are working within. Um, so I think in terms of you know, some of the stuff that we fund as the AHRC, um, traditionally, obviously, academic research, um, it can quite often be quite theoretical. It can quite often be research about the creative industries or about a subject. Um, and, it, and obviously, that would be very, very valuable. And we still believe in that as a very valuable part of what universities and researchers do. Um, and we still obviously have responsive MO programs that, 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 that cater for that. This program is not that. This is about um, a challenge based thing that's defined as part of the cluster of which they're part. So I think the way to sort of test that maybe is to think that if you took that challenge outside into the, into the cluster and you talked to the people that are working within that cluster and the industry and the companies that are in there and you presented that challenge to them, they have to be able to see themselves in it. They have to be able to say, yeah, I, ident I identify with that challenge. I can see that is a really valuable and, um, a thing that we're actually experiencing as part of, part of the, you know, this, this creative industries um, cluster that we're within. Um, we're saying it needs to be focused primarily on the creation of product services and experiences. Again, we think that's our best chance of being able to meet some of the kind of economic um, sort of uh, you know, uh, guidelines that we're having to kind of um, sort of fit within with this program in terms of the impact. Um, 
And also, it has to be able to be the challenge has to be able to be address addressed by the consortium of organisations that are coming together in the partnership. So it needs to be absolutely clear what each of those people are doing within that partnership to address that specific challenge. Um, and the other thing as well, obviously, and we we talked a bit about this this morning. This is this is quite an interesting and quite not not unproblematic one. Um, it has to be, you know, the challenges have to be distinct and measurable. So there has to be an idea, it has to be very obvious what that challenge is, but it also has to be obvious that there is a strategy by which you kind of achieve that challenge or which we can stand by it. And we appreciate that's obviously going to develop and grow over the length of the, of the award, and we will obviously work with you as an organisation to um, work out the best ways of kind of capturing the information and the, uh, and the data that we're going to need to capture around that. But ultimately, what we're looking for out of the challenge is it has to be able to lead to growth within the creative industries and within, particularly within the cluster that you are, you're working within. Um, so again, just to go over the sort of key points then, of what you're going to need to do when you put a bid together, um, there needs to be a very clear and coherent strategy and vision. So we were talking about the characteristics and strengths of the cluster with which, you're, with which you're working in. Um, the details of all the partnerships who's involved, the challenges that the partnerships are likely to address and how that cluster is going to uh, benefit from that partnership. Um, it, has to be, it has to be very clear about what the strategy is towards the collaborative R&D aspect of the programme, being that that is the main feature of what we're trying to propose here. Um, and how, how are the, you know, how, have you got a clearly defined programme of activities that that partnership are going to be able to take forward? Is there a clear rationale for why those, that R&D approach is the best way to respond to these challenges? Um, and how do they relate back to that overall strategy for what your partnership is trying to achieve? So collaboration. I think the program is entirely about collaboration. Um, it's about cross-sector, cross-disciplinary um, collaboration, and it's around kind of creating solutions to challenges that are faced by industry in that collaborative framework. Um, the other thing I think we're going to need to do with this, obviously, is they're complicated, big multi-partner programs that are potentially looking at a number of challenges, uh, they're potentially looking at new and innovative ways of doing and delivering against those challenges. Um, there's going to need to be very, very strong and shared leadership um, as part of these programmes. Um, and as Anthony mentioned this morning, when we talk about leadership, we're not talking about a traditional Arts and Humanities Research Council project PI type of model. Uh, we're talking about a kind of director, and that director could be somebody with the relevant research experience, but it could also be somebody from industry, somebody who's got the drive and the vision to be able to actually really drive this programme uh, that you're proposing forward. Um, but also, we need, there's going to be a need to be a really sort of strong governance structure, both within the partnership themselves, but also across the programme more widely. So we've obviously put in place some kind of ideas around what we'd like that governance to look like, and I think that's going to play a real key part in the way this programme develops and moves forward. So in terms of the key dates and milestones, um, if you can see any of those. So this is the last of the engagement events. This is eight out of eight, so by the end of this, we're, 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 we're kind of finished. I've done all of them, so like I said, I'm mentally and physically exhausted at this point. Um, but it, unfortunately, it doesn't stop for me now as well because we have to deliver all this other stuff afterwards. So the first thing that, might, that is going to be of interest is the deadline for the statement of intent submissions. You have to submit one of these if you want to go forward and submit a stage one bid. So please don't think that that is um, a, a sort of loose statement of intent for us just to get an idea. It, that is what it's to do. Um, so what we need to do with that is we need to get an idea about how many bids we're going to get what they're likely to be looking at, who they're going to be working with, as much information as you can possibly present about what you're likely to take forward as a stage one bid at that point. And that's really going to help us design our peer review. <coughs> it's going to make sure that we um, are able to deliver the programme in line with what we want its strategic aims to, to be able to do. So that's going to be really helpful for us. The other thing you're going to be able to do in that statement of intent is also request a meeting with us on a kind of one-to-one -one basis to talk through some of the issues. So those will happen in November, so we're going to call those bidders surgeries. Um, so the other main one to, to look at there then is the um, 7th of December. That's the stage one uh, bid uh, part of the process. That's when we want a kind of more developed, full kind of JES bid if you're used to submitting research council proposals. Um, that will come in. That will then go to, on to an, a kind of um, a collaborative assessment panel, uh, which will be made up of people from the HRC's college, peer review colleges, also EPSRC, ESRC, industry people, uh, people from trade bodies, relevant sector organisations. So we're, we're trying to balance that, and that's one of the things that your statement of intent is going to help us do. It's going to help us get the right people on that to assess the bid that you're putting together. Um, and then obviously then there's a second stage then, the stage two. That will be when you 
there'll be a certain number of bids shortlisted. So we're saying around about 12 to 14 at stage one. At that point, you will either be invited back to submit to stage two or we'll say, thanks very much for your interest, but we don't think this is quite right for this program. Um, or that there were just other 12 or 14 other better ones. Uh, frankly, it is a competition after all. Um, and that uh, you will also get specific feedback about the bid you've put in at stage one. So there will be some things that we'll be able to refine between that stage one and stage two point. It, that may include also the fact that we may have brought on some kind of program level partners as well that we might want you to be start thinking about how you would integrate those into your program um, for stage two. Um, there will then obviously be an interview panel for shortlisted applicants uh, that will happen in June. Uh, so the, what the uh, stage two panel will do is they'll kind of grade everything, rank them against quality, but they'll also pick out specific things they want the interview panel to press. So you will uh, can expect to answer some pretty difficult questions, I would imagine, at, at that point. Um, so then we're going to announce the successful programmes in July, and then we're expecting you to get cracking and start in October. So um, yeah, no pressure there, and it's not, not at all a quick uh, timeline and a difficult ask at all, I don't think. <laughs> um, okay, so just a final thought then on this programme uh, and, and how to think about it. I think... One of the things that we've done, we've got a particular strength thing as the Arts and Humanities Research Council, is research about the creative economy. And this is the stuff I was talking about, the, the kind of maybe slightly theoretical um, stuff that is about what the creative uh, economy is about, or what it needs, and how it can move forward. Um, one of the other things I think we tried to do, particularly through our KE Hubs program, um, was research with the creative economy. So that was get, uh, getting academics to work with um, sort of usually quite small, I think, creative industries, businesses, uh, SMEs, individual researchers, um, to actually work out a way to sort of collaborate with them. Um, and I think what this programme really needs to be about, really, is research for the creative economy. The benefits of this have to be... They, 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 we don't want them just sort of sitting within sort of nice, high-impact, referable case studies. These need to be, the benefits of this need to be felt within the industry itself. Um, so I think that's the, the, the sort of way to actually start thinking about it. So it's not going to be about that research uh, about. That's, that's kind of off the table for this. But the, what this is, is research with, but ultimately, research for the, the creative economy. OK, thanks. So um, I think we'll, uh, we've got a Q&A bit now. So yeah. I'm going to bring Anthony up. I'm also going to bring up Sumi David, who has been uh, responsible for developing... Well, she actually started this programme off, and I took over the role that she was doing in an interim period, but she's also been doing a lot of work around the re reporting and evaluation and monitoring, so she's kind of our expert on that. So Excellent. Um, so uh, just to say, given that we have, um, we have a, a strobe instead of a projector, <laughs> um, the slides are all going to be online on SlideShare. You'll get an email at the end or later in the day, which gives you the link. So if you want to go back and look at all that stuff, it's all going to be shared later on. That's right, isn't it, Tal? Um, we're going to email in a couple of days. Oh, a couple of days, okay. Oh, there you go, and it's been oh, tweeted already. Oh. Because we are so modern. Now. <laughs> That's what um, okay, so um, we have Mike in the room because we are recording in case elements of not more questions come up because it's a bidding process. We're going to share questions with anybody who wants to see them. So we have Mike in the room. If you have specific questions, we've got 10 minutes or so before we go to um, a panel discussion. If there are specifics you'd like to explore, stick your hand in the air, tell us who you are, we'll get a mic to you. Anybody got anything? Please have a question. Richard down the front here, right next to you, Richard. Uh, Anthony, the, um, how do you really envisage the process of all of the relatively small companies engaging at this point? You know, in terms of, if I understand it right, it's their themes, their needs that need to be at the core of this. Yep. How, how, how do you imagine that's harvested at this stage? Okay. Can I tell that? So, so at risk of pointing it back at you, which is I'm good, slightly what I'm going to do, Richard, I think there's a key role for intermediary organisations, trade associations, um, you know, the, the kind of public policy bodies that, that connect to those organisations. But there, there is also, I mean, there is, a, there is a bit of a kind of chicken and egg about that a question, because if those connections are just not there between the HEIs and the sector or can't, you know, cannot be increased and substantiated quite quickly. It's quite a genuine existential question about whether there's a real relationship between the higher education institution and the cluster. So I think that if there is, you put, as you, I knew you would, put your finger on the $64 million, or in this case, £8 million pound question, which is you've got to have that, and you've got to find that quite quick. Um, mm. and, and, and I know there is a cluster here, but there are N versions of what you might do. Mm. And that's quite tricky. Yeah. So I think intermediary organisations got a really important role. 
these events have turned out to be more about the HEI sector with some industry people. We're going to do a bunch of sort of industry-facing PR quite soon as well mm -hmm. um, to talk about it. Yeah, we're also going to um, try and, uh, uh, off the back of these events, we've actually got some time to catch our breath and think about what we're going to do with the information and some of the people we've been meeting and talking to through these events. We're actually going to try and get something on our website which is going to enable um, some of those intermediary organisations to put their contacts up and um, to actually be able to, you, you, you to basically be able to get in touch with those and see if there's anything they can do with you. Because we've been talking to a number of those as we've been going around. So just to clarify on which point, we don't have to have those relationships before the end of next week. No. No, no I mean, you have to... statement of intent. No. No. Like, there has to be a strategy. Uh, how we get there in that sort of No, no, you don't. I mean, you, you need to be able to credibly say you're going to be able to get mm. them, and any of them you do have, you can put in. But actually, just to sort of... I'm not going to downplay the statement of intent. The statement of intent is a, it, it actually came from a different place. Mm -hmm. It came from a different place. The place was there were some sceptical people in, 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 the, in government when we got the money who didn't think there'd be any demand for this. <laughs> and we are blowing that notion yeah. out of the water. But we are now turning it to our own uses, yeah, yeah. which is to indicate sort of the demand we're likely to yeah. be engaging with and what sort of t issues. But are you looking for creative companies to put statements of intent in? No, the, the, the partnership puts the statement yeah. in. Okay. So a company literally could be, you know, we've talked to. Yeah, we but know I'm saying, how do you get a partnership together in a week? There are already lots of people in the room working on it. Okay. So <laughs> Frank Lyons is nodding. He's, I think, running the <laughs> UU Queen's um, process at the moment. Okay. One of the reasons for this room is so you can meet. Do you, people know Frank, but wave your arm, Frank. Yeah. That's Frank. Go on, microphone to Frank, please. I mean, obviously, colleagues from Queen's are, are in the room as well. We've had numerous conversations. Um, many with Richard and Donald from NI Screen, for instance, just because of the speed of the process, we just haven't had a chance to get around absolutely everybody. No. But I think you know we have been lobbying, and the reason why a number of um, colleagues are in the room from the industrial sector are because of the conversations that we've had already. Yeah. So you know, if we haven't had a conversation with you, absolutely, it's time to do it today. So. Yeah. Um, just yeah. to add, I mean, in the statements of intent, we ask for people to actually just note if they're happy for it to be public, what they've put through, and it's precisely for that reason, so that we can make that available to actually pinpoint people to each other. You know, it's the time frame. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Not, not the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I th you know, don't, I would say don't fixate over the detail of the statement of intent. You know, it's, it's, it's more, yes, we'll be in the room with some detail. Yeah. It isn't, uh, you know, whatever is available, whatever can be provided. Um, and by the way, we're not driving the timescale. Mm. The industrial strategy and the government are driving the timescale. We built this entire thing, for the sake of your knowledge, in about six weeks mm -hmm. as a programme. The whole bid, everything, in about six weeks. And nobody slept for a while. And ideally, we'd have liked a year and a half. Yeah, I mean, normally, <laughs> yeah. you know, a bunch of things, you know, we're amongst friends. A bunch of things which are assumptions that we are saying will probably work is what they are. Because you would have tested a bunch of the <laughs> assumptions of a programme like this. But then you wouldn't have got the money. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so being really pragmatic, we went for it. Um, yeah. And I think we're, we're hope, we'll hope to learn how to better support these kinds of things in the future through this activity as well. So part of what we're going to be doing and part of what Sumi's responsible for is running a kind of process evaluation on how, you know, what, what do we need to do to enable a programme that may develop out of this to be able to be done in a slightly more like structured, structured and, and, and uh, yeah, tailored way. So we, we, we do appreciate it. it's a very, very difficult ask yeah. um, without a shadow of a doubt. And we do know it's, you know, um, but we're taking that into account when we're talking about how we're going to assess the, the bids and the programmes as well. So, It's catch-22 though, isn't it? Because industry people always say, well, the thing is it all moves really slowly on this higher education stuff. And then you find something and it moves quick and everybody goes, oh, my God, it's so quick. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are some elements under which you sort of can't win for trying to win. Um, there's the amount of time there is, and it'll be as good as, a, as it is in the amount of time we've got to do it. Frank, you got something? Yeah. Uh Elephant in the room, the match funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the expectations of AHRC in the programme in terms of how... That you yeah. personally get your checkbook out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think we're, asking, we're, we're kind of asking you to make a commitment to, to meet that match funding, the expected match funding, which is around about a third of the overall value of the, the programme, um, I would say. Um, so at that point, we're not going to expect you to have an itemised list of all of these match funding sources with full auditable... Um, spreadsheet of, uh, of delivery when the money's coming in and when, you know that sort of thing. We don't expect that at all at that point. But what we would like you to have there is a is a making a commitment that you you have a strategy for how to meet that. Um, you, you know, if you've got match funding available already, if you've got some sources that you know are going to be able to deliver against this program, should you be funded, 
we want to know about those. Absolutely, that would be fantastic. Um, but, but we just want really you to have a kind of idea. And also, we're, we're not really talking about this as match funding. We're talking about is leverage funding. We're talking about using this program to leverage funding from other sources as well and counting that towards the overall leverage amount that, that, that we hope to be able to get through this program. I'll yeah. cover this in greater detail later, but um, certainly we expect this to be phased very much. We, we you know, recognise a spike in kind contribution from a variety of organisations as well. And it was deliberately set as a challenging level. Yeah. You know, we, we, we deliberately, and this was the decision made at HRC Council, was we're going to bid for quite a lot of money. We're going to expect the universities to come alongside in quite a big way compared to what they've done previously to prove that this is actually worth doing. Um, you know, one of the VCs who sits on council was very clear. He said, look, the medics never asked for a couple of million pounds. The medics rock up and ask for 200 million, and then, they, then we have to find the match, because we do. And, the one, and he said one of the problems, and he's on our council, one of the problems with arts and humanities is you always ask for tiny sums of money, which everybody can sort of find in their general budget or not. You don't ever get the ask right. Um, and so it's a big challenge, the match funding from the HEI side. We know that, but it's... It's sort of it's, it's deliberately about playing in the right tier. But again, just to, just to make sure we're we're on the right track here. I mean, for the universities, the way it's been outlined, it's essentially money in, money out, and the main beneficiaries will be the industry partners. Okay, we're going to have to get some money to the table from them as well. But essentially, that's the way universities are looked at. And thinking about regional partners as well and other opportunities, whether it's also working with investors from the start to think how they might come into the programme at different stages as well. There's a couple, we'll come to this other question. There's a couple of, there's quite, there are several programme level conversations going on as well. You know, so for instance, there may well be a local instantiation of the BBC in a Northern Irish bid, but there will also be a BBC conversation, well there is because I'm leading it, BBC conversation about how it works with the whole programme. There are similar conversations going on with, for instance, you know, through Adams Good Offices, a big advertising agency, how they might engage with a couple of big games companies um, where, where you know, there's particular areas where they might be able to co-invest and come alongside. So that, that and another thing that comes out in the statement of intent process. A uh, question down from Green. You got, who's microphone, please? Just whizzing in. Come from this, 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 this. It's just really a follow-on question from Frank. Yeah. Um, when and um, how much commitment is required for the match funding? You know, is it required at the statement in the, um, statement of intent, or at stage one, or at stage two? Uh, the commitment would need to be made at stage one. Um, we, we've, we have asked about match funding at the statement of intent um, because we just want to get an idea about people that may have already have some ideas around what they're going to do with that. Um, so that you know, all of that is intelligence for us to be able to put together, a, you know, a, a better expectations about how we're going to peer review, uh, who we're going to get to peer review, and what we can actually direct them to think about when they're actually looking at the bids. Um, but the, yeah, the, the commitment will, would need to be made at stage one, and obviously there's a period of time between stage one and stage two where things can develop and sharpen up again. Uh, but in terms of the actual match funding itself, what we're saying is by the midpoint of the programme, should you be funded, we would have e expected you to be able to meet at least 20% of that match funding commitment. Um, uh, you know, otherwise we'll, we'd need to enter into kind of negotiation about how we're going to deal with that issue. Um, and then 33% would be over the lifetime of the of the award. So we're not expecting you to have 33% upfront. Uh, that would need to then be kind of like phased over the lifetime of the award and then put into things that are actually genuinely valuable for what the programme of research and development that you're trying to do actually actually are. And I think we recognise that once you, those have <coughs> gone through the shortlisting process and that once they're shortlisted, it makes it a lot easier as well to get that commitment. It makes it a lot easier to go to your to vice chancellors, it's a lot easier to go to chief execs and, of companies and say this is really, you know, really going to happen or likely to happen. Um, so I think we're, we're quite mindful of that. Yeah, yeah and I that's true of the programme levels. Yeah, I was going to say you need to you know, be mindful of the fact that if you're only asking for some of it up front, the world could change by yes. the end mm -hmm. of the project. So what I'm assuming you won't want is that a project is funded and then finds halfway through it doesn't There's have all of its yeah. Yeah. We have a significant yeah. risk register that has yeah. that involved. Yeah. But we've also that that's the kind of thing that we, we through the governance structures, through the kind of steering boards and the leadership board and then the programme board as well. I think those are the kinds of issues that we're going to be like monitoring on a, on a very regular basis and trying to keep ahead of what the, those kind of issues that are coming up might yeah. be. And then we can think about strategies for how we're gonna actually gonna be able to deal with that and support you with that. Yeah, and, and keeping it as a real partnership, I mean, which again is slightly different from how HRC have done, dealt with big programs, um, to keep it actually with case officers, people working and uh, in dialogue, I guess, with each of these creative R&D partnerships, mm. so that these problems don't suddenly appear. We're all aware of it and thinking about it over the course of the program. Yeah, but coming from central, um, professional services of the university it would be you know we'd be wanting to make sure that 
we're not then left carrying the can yeah. in yep. the longer exactly. term. No. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'd be absolutely. No, one of the things we've learned the at the sort of council level is let's be on board all the time so we can see what's happening. Yeah. Mm. Don't measure at the end and then be surprised. You know, mm. let's not be yeah. shocked. Yeah. And okay. okay, question behind. Uh, yes, I'm Patricia Erskine. I'm from actually from the University of Edinburgh, but I find myself Hello, here. Hello, Patricia. Today. So, <laughs> so you, we've been talking about Northern Ireland all morning. <laughs> no, no, that's 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 grand, and I'm going to ask a general question. Okay. Um, just I wanted to ask about um, how you feel we should or how you'd advise us to handle issues like entrepreneurship, and uh, because you know company formation that might not have happened yet, but that we're trying to encouraging encourage through this development of these new services and experiences. Um, products as well. Um, is uh, are you going to look to see some experience of that track record? Um, will you want to see or have an expectation of funding coming into that from investors <laughs> through the program? Mm -hmm. Just wondering about that. Yeah. Do you want to go? And I'll come in at the end. Well, I think uh, w yeah. Well, I think uh, given the f industry focus of the program, we're obviously wanting to encourage entrepreneurship. We're also want to encourage people to commercialise those ideas and be able to sort of carry them forward from the R and D process into a, into the market effectively. Um, in terms of how the partnerships work with, with that that kind of structure, this is why we're, we are asking, this is not a usual thing for an AHLC programme, we're asking for kind of collaboration agreements to be put in place before we release the funding. So just to make sure that everyone's kind of clear about what the expectations are on who owns the IP, who's the, mo who's the best place person to commercialise. and a collaboration framework, thing. I guess, yeah. in, in some ways, so that you, you have an expectation as new companies, created as new companies and partners join. <sighs> have a joint expectation, I suppose, yeah, a shared expectation. Yeah. I think we just want to make sure that everyone's clear up front about, you know, what the, ex when, if you're buying into this partnership, you know, what the expectations are on you as an organisation or an entity or a person, an individual, a freelancer or whatever, um, that, you know, it's very clear from the outset what, what, what would be expected of them. I mean, we're also going to help you, we're going to get, in terms of things like IP and stuff, we are going to actually get, um, pretend, or, or offer you a, uh, a session with an independent IP consultant to be able to think through some of the issues around how you handle those kind of things. And in terms of things like collaboration agreements and contracting with SMEs and micros and things like that, those are the sort of things we want you to start thinking about and have a real kind of strategy in place for how you, how you manage it. So because they're, they're, they're all difficult in the relationship between HEIs and universities, I'm going to come to it from a slightly different place, which is how you could potentially f um, sort of thread into the bid um, really interesting sort of USPs that are about exactly how you handle those questions. So, you know, how might you use relationships to industry mentors to do those things? A sort of, there's a sort of slightly classic university knowledge transfer spin-out model. I think it's not that, because I don't think it's terribly <coughs> successful in this sector full stop. Um, and the IP models are quite challenging. So that's implicit in what Dylan just said. But actually, that somebody uh, said, talked to me earlier, in fact, Kate, uh, Katie was coming on a bit, talked to me earlier about how you might you use mentorship for these sorts of things. How do you do skills development, with, which is bilateral? You know, how do you get those bloody VCs who aren't vice chancellors to engage in some constructive way rather than moaning about things not being ready for investment? We'll get them in early then. You know, those sorts of things. Um, but it, it, it's, it, there isn't really room in there for a kind of abstracted entrepreneurship program. It has to be applied in practice to the things in the challenge. It's rather the same as the IP piece. You know, uh, the, you know, if, if, your, if your approach to IP, you know, we, have, we fund the Create Centre in Glasgow, just down the road you. You know, if, if, um, if your approach to the IP is, if your challenge you think is, what is the future of IP in the creative industries? That's not an operable challenge. It's going to lead to products, services and experiences. If your challenge includes a really difficult IP problem, which is about those products, services and experiences, and you need amazing IP people, and amazing entrepreneurial people to deliver it, that's in scope for us, really seriously in scope for us. But, and if out of that comes a publishable thing for your IP um, lawyer um, um, partner, which is an academic output, great. And we're not measuring that as our primary output. It's got to come from the applied activity. And I would say as a, a sort of practitioner academic, that's the, that's the really interesting territory, that kind of how do you embed it into the programme. And it's a similar model to, in a way, how you do skills development in the programme. You know, we, we can't fund explicit skills development in a very explicit way. But if your programme is approaching things in such a way that you've got transferable models of different ways of skilling people up, that looks like a feature of a good programme. Mm. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't know how you do it, but it looks like a feature of a good programme. Okay. In the middle. And then we'll go to the panel, unless we've anybody else desperate. Hi. Uh, good morning. Um, two questions, actually. Firstly, to clarify on match funding, is that cash... And/or benefits in kind. Yeah, absolutely. Both. In kind, both. in kind, both. I mean, if there's cash, amazing, brilliant. 
Um, we recognise, obviously, the nature of the kind of companies or organisations you might be working with. They may not have a lot of capital to put up front into it, um, uh, which is completely fine. But, um, but yeah, in-kind contributions. I mean, we're going to need to think about how we kind of capture that, but that's one of the things I think we're going to work through, work through with you in terms of you know, thinking about how you actually make a valid case for what is in-kind and what's actually been contributed into the programme, that sort of thing. But yeah, in-kind's absolutely on the table. Just to parallel that, however, in a number of the regions, it's not how, it's an and. Mm. In a number of the regions and nations, there's proper cash from LEP, mm. you know, national investment organisations, not naming any names in this room, <laughs> that you know, needs to be got at, probably. Uh, it isn't an absolute requirement, but hey, it's going to look like you've got a really serious mm. cluster with a long-term strategy in the event that people are putting money. So we had a LEP, Director of Creative Industries, yeah. a LEP in where were we? Birmingham, Birmingham, I think, yeah. And he basically got his cheque with that. Mm. Yeah. So, okay, we've got to work out how much then. Yeah. What we're I think do I, with it. And that does give some credibility in terms of that you know, it is aligned with the overall development strategy for the creative industries in those regions as well. So I think that kind of gives it some gravitas in terms of the fact there's cash behind it, but also that it's aligned with what is actually happening on the ground. So... Did you have a follow-up? Yeah, a uh, follow-up question. Given our unique position with the Republic of Ireland and Brexit, how do you view as a UK programme involvement of, say, down south organisations, yep. whether mm -hmm. universities, whether yep. companies, are they counted, are they not counted? Yep. Yeah. Well, we have an international investigator, co-investigator policy anyway for research, which we've always allowed, um, irrespective of whatever programme that we fund. And that very much is, is part and parcel of this. And then likewise, I think with businesses, I think that the, the issue is how we, it, the, the difficulty will be funding those businesses directly. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the one issue, but certainly not in terms of them being actively involved as part of that collaboration. Yeah. That but but I think if, if you can trace the benefit back to that cluster yeah. as well, that, I mean, because it could be, I mean, we appreciate obviously that, you know, as we've been mentioned this morning, you know, activity, partnerships, networks don't just stop. A, 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 a hard border which has been drawn by a compass around a, a point on, the, on a map um, you know so it, it's about articulating the case for how the collaboration with some of those organizations that may be outside of the country they may be in not in, just in Republic of Ireland they may be overseas maybe in the States maybe in Canada anywhere around how are they actually benefiting that cluster because obviously this program is primarily aimed at UK economic benefit so that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about um, in terms of how you frame that so, um, but yeah, 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 but there's a subtle Global point in that. Dynamic of exactly, that I was about to say. There's yeah. a subtle point about, not even that subtle, about trade, mm. and in particular in some of the creative industries, about inward investment. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if what's dynamic in the cluster, we're here, we know that's a big part of one part of the creative industries cluster here, which is in the room. You know, that, that's a key part of the dynamic of the cluster. So if it's going to reinforce that, which in turn reinforces the cluster, you're not going to close it down because of some notional um, sort of geography. I think that is extraordinarily potent here. Were I writing a bid, <laughs> I would be really cognizant of that right at this moment in time. I'm not going to say anyone that. One, one more then, and then we'll, we'll go to the panel. Hello, my name is Kirsten Kearney. I Hi, run a very small filmmaking charity here in Belfast and works across Northern Ireland. Um, I was just interested, a lot of these conversations around match funding, they've been like throwaway comments that there's been no mention of earlier. So those of us coming from the industry who haven't maybe got all of the background that the universities have, there was one of you made a throwaway comment about match funding from the industry. Um, is match funding expected across the board? Because if you're working, as you say, like as a micro business, no. So, so from our point of view, they'll come on the detail, I'm sure. But from our point of view, there is a kind of match funding from the industry in the in the aggregate, sort of total. But not everybody involved in the project, company-wise, has to provide match funding. Quite the opposite. So, in fact, very unusually for a program of this kind. Uh, a, a filmmaker, individual filmmaker, would potentially be in receipt of funding. Okay. Net, they would receive, but the net, that somewhere in the netting out, there'd have to be some match from the industry across the programme. But that's more likely to be large-scale companies bringing R&D resource or cash that they're already spending or, or cash um, than it is at the sort of small level. Because that's a really key determinant. Phil said earlier, you know, if I'm expected to pay for the right to do this, then I can't do that. How you do that as a cluster is interesting. What the model is. Are they fellowships? Are they? What, I don't know what they are. Are they, you know, um, uh, sort of what, what, what the models? Placements, placements, secondments. secondments. How do they work? Have Open for discussion in the cluster. Um, but no, what are the best suits, really? Whatever you're yeah. trying to address, or absolutely that. You know, but the aim is not, you know, you know, those sort of rather spurious things where everybody then ends up trying to pretend they're spending a lot of time on something to make the match funding look like a good number so they can get the cash out. We know that. Everybody in the room who's ever done any of this, which is everybody, knows that that's a constructed 
sort of bureaucracy thing. It's not going to help the, the piece get done. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Happy? Yeah. Anybody got a desperate question? We've got time. We're around. You've got a bidder's workshop. Yeah. I um, hope that was useful. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to bring up the panel. We're just going to kick around some other points of view and some thoughts. Um, just um, um, have, uh, take a deep breath while everybody comes up. And we'll go. Thank you, Sumi and Dylan. Great stuff. So I've got, um, in going from my right, I've got Kitty Crawford, uh, Chair of Games and I. Hello. Um, and Richard Williams, who have been known to many of you, Chief, Chief Exec of NI Screen. Uh, and then I've got Karen, uh, Professor Karen Fleming, Head of the Belfast School of Art, and uh, Tom Gray, Director of Innovation at Kanos and Invest NI. And Digital right? Catapult NI. Mm. Digital Catapult NI. I knew there was something else. Um, so um, these guys were, were sort of primed with a, with a set of questions, which have usually either been answered or made very confusing uh, by the end of the morning session. Um, um, first sort of question coming out from me would be, let's start with where you see the biggest opportunity and challenge in what we're describing. Um, Kitty, you, you were telling me some of these when we started. Do you mind kicking off? So, <laughs> opportunity and what we've got to get right, and then we'll, we'll, I'll come down the panel with that same question. Um, yeah, so I got the questions through, and I, I, I wrote a whole bunch of notes down. Um, uh, can we define the question a little bit? Yeah, well, what's something? on your notes? What's, what's, oh, what's in my notes? Um, define well, challenges, is that a big yeah, issue? Yeah, so um, the first question was, how do we define the challenges? Yeah. Um, part of Games <laughs> and I, part of our approach has been at multiple points over the past three years since we started up, um, was to sit in the room with game developers, people developing in Northern Ireland, and asking them, okay, what, what are the problems, what are the blockers? Um, but it never, like for us, having those conversations is great and having outcomes of them, but it's the actions that are the things that, uh, that is the focus that's kind of miss missing right now anyway. Um, one of the like, objectives that we wanted to do, um, at least for the past two years, is do some kind of facilitation or, or scoping study with um, the collaborative group to pinpoint what those things are. Right. So you know, we can say, okay, funding is an issue, skills gaps are an issue, but how far that goes and where those things could be applicable are things that still need to we be pinpointed. Okay. Yeah, so like, you know, Northern Ireland Screen has been fantastic for the games industry and the funding that they provide, but funding for other areas and not just sort of putting the funding out there, but the mentorship that could go along with that. Right. So those are, th those are big challenges in defining the challenge and bringing the cluster together. Yeah. Okay, that's, I mean, that's, that's good call and, and I, and not surprising, but still difficult, yeah. I think is probably true. Richard, does that ring true? What do you think in terms of big yeah, challenge, big yeah. opportunity? I mean, well, I mean, the first thing I would say is there's a lot to play for here. I mean, it's this, and it's nearly, I mean, you alluded to it, and you're talking about uh, Basil Jett's report and where this is going in terms of UK <coughs> policy. I mean, um, I've been around long enough to see how radical this is in, in, the, in a number of ways. The biggest, the biggest bit being, from a Northern Ireland perspective, that um, at the very least we have an equal opportunity to any other part of the UK in terms of, in terms of the development of something that could very much strengthen and, and uh, step our uh, creative <coughs> industries, screen industries cluster uh, forward. That's pretty, that's pretty radical. It's very different to uh, the public sector broadcasting landscape that I spend a yep. lot of my time in. Uh, the other thing that is a m massive opportunity is that uh, you know the underlying purpose to get industry uh, and academia closer together and to get them closer together in the context of research and development. This is a you, you know this is a hugely uh, credible and entirely appropriate ambition, and this is again a huge opportunity for us. So I mean this this is. This is very, very good stuff. You, you, you know, you got a clue to my question in terms of a certain point from Phil, I think. There's also, in anything that is as ambitious as that, there's also an enormous challenge. How do you do it, yeah. And the, the, the enormous challenge, I think, you know, is gonna require a lot, of, a lot of mediation. You know, companies are not day and daily thinking about what their needs would be. And they do all have relationships with both Queen's and uh, Ulster University. The vast, vast majority of these people have, have come through them. So, you know, they have quite deep and long uh, relationships. They are 
predominantly these days around skills development. And that's good and excellent, and we encourage you to want more than that. But this is, this is something a little bit different. So it, it is going to take a lot of energetic and committed thinking to get the right list of problems to solve and the beginnings of the imagined solutions. But that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing, not a, not a bad thing. Yeah. It's because this, this is targeting absolutely the right challenge. And the great thing for us is that um, you know, we're being invited to the party, so that's, that's a good thing. Well, that, it's really interesting to hear that from you and sort of encouraging to hear that from you. And I think it, it is designed to be radical in that way whilst being, it's sort of radically, blindingly obvious. Um, um, to, to a lot of people in the industry, which is interesting. How does it look from inside um, your position, Karen? And um, you know, you, the, the university so you use sort of reconfiguring to some extent mm -hmm. around uh, creative industries and art, but it has such a long track record going back to the foundation. I mean, how does it look from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, in, ma in many ways, this looks like most research applications with industry should look. So I think it's fantastic that industry are more equal partners in this. I think that's uh, really welcomed. It is a great opportunity for us, a bit like the Basel Gets report coming out at the same time as looking suspicious that um, things have been known before they came out. We have been planning very much uh, along the lines of how do we meet the needs of industry, how do we work more agile with industry. It, uh, our challenge will be that it's very difficult to grow graduates in four years. So yeah. it takes three or four years. We encourage them to have placements, so usually it's four years. Um, so that's a challenge. It takes four years to, to bring a new graduate programme through and, of course, our, our wonderful assembly have limited the numbers in both universities. So yes. if we want to do something new, if we, if we really come up with a new discipline in the area, which is very possible. Um, when I was a student, there weren't many of the disciplines that there are now. So if we came up with a new thing that should be there, um, we haven't got the, the student places to do it. So we're unusual in the UK in that we're limited right. in our student numbers and we're not allowed to increase them. Right. We can be very agile with master's numbers and I think uh, our PhD support that we have from our, our national policies in Northern Ireland are fantastic. We have a really well qualified PhD cohort. We've worked across with Queen's um, on one of the creative industry hubs where we looked at their needs. They are, there is definitely a, creative, a real creative sector here that does speak to each other, that knows each other, that generally know how to um, connect. Um, many of them are solo or micro some of them SME, but really at the solo micro end, and they do work together with collaborating and competition. One of our challenges is how to bring new people in. So we have lots of people who leave Northern Ireland, and how do we bring them in, and how do they go into a porous creative industry economy? So I think that's one of the other challenges, is not just to look at our own graduates. Right. Very tempting when you're in a university to do that. You feel, you know, you have a love for your own alumni, and you want them to thrive. But I think we've also got to look at how we, we, we make the region work outside of just our own graduates. I think we can be a little bit insular in saying we have a we have a creative industries cluster here because it is a bit like a family, everybody knows everybody. Eventually um, in the sectors that overlap they get to know other graduates from here. Right. But I think we're a little bit more difficult for people to come into. To come into it. It's really interesting that Richard and I met each other probably nearly twenty years, haven't we? In, in various conversations a decade ago there were talks about some of the, some of the UK digital media companies of South East based coming over here and we, we looked at it really hard and that's kind of where I slightly fell in love with this place and then and I met Paul Moore and I've been coming backwards and forwards and it is true that actually when you explain what goes on over here over in on the other side of the water it sounds more impressive than people here think it is mm -hmm. because it is more impressive than people here think it is and also because you can get things done and you can see them getting done at a certain scale mm -hmm. that's why I actually personally that's why I took the chair here and somewhere else because you can do things here we can be with really good people you can to. be quite agile and there's really interesting and difficult stuff to get done you know you can make no impact on the on london in the creative industries from a university really ever um which is interesting they wouldn't say that obviously other universities are available um tom um you're, you're from the tech side of this how do, does this how does this sound in terms of the, the you know the, the challenges and the opportunities how does it fit with the way you you think about the world and the catapult thinks about the world sure well, yes probably my biggest challenge is how the challenges that we have actually fit within the remit of this program yeah um i, mean, I probably feel somewhat fraudulent um, being on the panel because if you look at it in black and white, I'm not really part of the creative economy. I probably shouldn't look at it black and white. That's maybe one of the challenges that we need to solve. Um, but from a Kenos perspective first, um, we've been focused on a digital transformation, IT services for years. Yeah. And we've hired brilliant engineers, done brilliant work, fine. Over the past 
probably decade, we've increasingly recognized the value of non-engineers in our business. Um, and we've brought in service designers, we've brought in graphic designers, we've brought in storytellers. Um, and that's, I guess, both been driven by demands from clients, but also because we think it gives us um, a little bit of a competitive advantage. So, I mean, I guess, is there an opportunity here to, you know, try and, you know, enhance or accelerate, you know, that integration of the creative industry, if I can use that term, mm -hmm. with the, I won't say non-creative, but with the tech sector, um, and use that as a platform for, you know, creating real innovation in NI and the UK generally. Yeah. Um, and I think it probably becomes more important as we look at the emerging technologies that are appearing at the moment. So you've got immersive technology, you've got AI, you've got connected systems. You know, technologies all broadly kind of sort of work. Um, we can, as, an, as engineers, broadly kind of make it work for a client. But how do we know that we're creating the most engaging solution? How do we know that, I guess, the outcomes that we expect the technology to have actually works? Yeah. Um, and we've been working, sorry, again, this is Ken, has been working with UU um, over the past few months on a client engagement where I guess we're doing the technology implementation and UU is providing um, the research behind the scenes that actually suggests that our, our thesis around usability and effectiveness actually is correct. Okay. So that, I, I guess, is an industry perspective on this from a digital catapult perspective. Um, you're probably aware that we're focused on um, helping SMEs grow and scale through the effective use of emerging technology. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at the AIs and the immersive techs that I mentioned. Um, one of our core focus areas is the creative industries. Um, and I guess on paper that looks like how do we help evangelize and support the creative industries to make better use of immersive technology or AI within, I guess, their businesses. Um, and that's great and that's valid. Um, but I think there's another dimension, which is I mean, if you look at AI and immersive and data as being underpinning um, you know, resources for multiple sectors, you know, is there an opportunity to use the creative industry, the creative skills as an underpinning um, building block for solutions, be it in healthcare, be it in financial services, be it in legal? Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd be keen to explore, you know, is the creation of that <coughs> sort of facility resource within NI, you know, a challenge that fits within the remit of this type of programme? Okay, shall I, I shall take that and then we'll, we'll, Sorry, we'll kick it right now. Question You're asking a question to me, you, this, <laughs> you know, Phil set the tone for that, didn't he, earlier on? Um, so what we were careful with in the formulation of this programme, and it was, you know, done quick and done by a relatively small number of people, was um, to try and ensure its centre of gravity was firmly inside the creative industries themselves. 11% of the economy, end jobs, that stuff. Not because we didn't, and we don't recognise them, because of course we do recognise the kind of, let's call them spillover mm -hmm. benefits into other sectors or the transferability into other <coughs> sectors. But I have to say I'm sort of personally really super passionate about two things. One, that there's just not been enough focused money in the creative industries for the actual creative industries outcomes. And two, which is the flip side of that, that there's lots of money that's been chased in other areas. Like, so health would be a good example, where actually sort of there's clear lots of, lots of things you can do with immersive um, storytelling around mental health, lots of examples, but where the cart and the horse are slightly the wrong way round. Um, so um, there's, uh, I, I was really, pa really sort of focused with this um, the core money that we should ensure there's a bunch of measurables that come to creative industries. But of course, this is the real world. So in the same way that this, is, this fund is not primarily about cultural value and social cohesion, these are the creative industries. So the things that you do generate culture uh, one way or another. Um, and so you, you know, there's no hard boundary. So I think a bid that was clearly had its heartland in the creative industries, but that was um, conscious of those spillover benefits and where they might be essentially kind of avenues to be exploited next, is clearly a really interesting and strong bit. But if it was, what we're going to do is the creative industries in healthcare, I think that's more of a challenge, actually, as the only bid. Um, if what you're doing is something around storytelling and well-being, and one of the things is healthcare, and one of the things is parenting, I don't know, I don't know what the bid is. 
Um, I think there is more room. But it's sort of car it's about the cart and the horse um, um, with this particular framing. Um, now, when you come to potential work on immersives, I think it'll be broader. It'll be to do with creativity inside immersives. I was going to bring to Kitty, I was going to bring um, Tom's sort of core point about the underlying technologies. So I'm assuming, because I've worked in games, that people are not disinterested in AI and deep ML and all sorts of other things. So where's the, the, the how do we get them interconnected so that a big piece of work happens in the cluster with the universities, companies like Kanos, the games companies, how do we bring them together? Because everybody's sort of saying, how do we get the right companies to work with the right research people? How do we yeah. do it? What can we, where do we start? First step on the road. Yeah, well, it's an interesting question because as, uh, as chair of Games and I, that's been one of our problems for the past two years, okay. trying to keep everybody more interconnected. Um, one of the main issues is that as an association, all of our members and everybody on the committee, we're also business owners. Busy doing so, stuff, yeah. yeah, we're yeah. we're business owners or we're producers or we're heading up companies and having um, the time to to put focus into that is is tough. Yeah. Um, now, I, you know, there, there's propositions that we've sort of gave to that, um, but at the minute, like, there's what. 17 companies involved in our association, but 34 actively operating in Northern Ireland right now in the games industry, as, okay. far, as, as far as I've been following it. Right. But the network itself, like the, the, the hub, the industry in Northern Ireland, is still very young, it's still very small, and it's, I would describe it kind of as, as, a, bit, as a bit fragile. The network is, is, is loose. Right. And I think part of the problem is, although there's a lot of activity going around Games NI and NI Screen and an effort being put into it, there's not this particular connecting everybody together. I don't think there's like one person okay. or one entity that's constantly trying to keep these areas connected. And I think that if there was somebody, either a facilitator or a collaborator or somebody who was a point of contact that is connecting all these people together that wasn't voluntary, that okay. that would quickly develop. So, that, so you're coming to a key point that's come up this morning in other places which I'll ask you all about, which is leadership. Uh, of this thing, how, uh, you know, this, this partnership and how that's that's drawn together, um, uh, because clearly that's the time to to, to, to have uh, leadership, but also the right people, the right person to do it. Uh, it's facetious to say, but I opened the initial London event of this to a big house of people at, um, in in say in Westminster with the sentence, I wonder what it is that drew all of you here to the £85 million pound program launch this morning. Um, we unusually have got one of the powerful convening functions here, in that if you can pull a cluster together which has got funding of this kind of scale, it's chicken and egg, but if you don't have that kind of capacity, you won't get the money for that capacity, and then you won't be able to build on it. So it's one potato, two potato. Yeah. This is something that, you know, um, persuading people to decide they want to build a paint hall into a studio can't, but kind of look quite similar in some ways, like at the start. You've got to get the right people, you've got to have the right leadership. Yeah, of course. Um, I think in some ways, you know, this has some of the hard yards done. I mean, there, you know, there is a, there is a pot um, of funding to be, to be bid for here. It's a, you know, this is a kind of ours to lose scenario as opposed to, uh, you know, having to articulate, you know, something that's the that's, entire that's, whole, uh, that's wholly abstract. Right. But um, yeah, and that's you know, you go back, you go. Back to that, it's iterative. I mean, I think from from Kitty's point, the interesting thing, I mean, there's a link, a very obvious link between the two yeah. comments that were being made, and yeah. this this um, this has the potential to create the context for for the link. Uh, micro businesses lack stability. They lack uh, they lack central focus. Actually, the gaming. Community's done a great job because it, is, it has galvanised itself. It's created its own its own body, but to have anything that has scale and stability uh, sitting alongside it is is very useful. And if there was something effectively that came out of this program that linked some of the scale and strength that ha we we have over here with the creativity yep. um, that that we uh, have over here, you know, you're beginning to. You're beginning to get somewhere. And that sort of, that, Karen, that was, sort of, for me, that was implicit in what you were saying about the role. It's a sort of civic university point in HGI, yeah. isn't it? What's your role in the city, in the region, 
how can you provide that sort of centre of gravity? I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an immediate issue in terms of how you write the governance and the communication within this bid, but also we need to have a view to what's the legacy of that and how does that communication between the networks continue? And that's always the challenge writing any grant, but I think <coughs> this one particularly, yeah. where we're not seeing this as a fixed term project. And, and in education, we always have a vision of, of where our students go. And of course, the creative industries are about the people more than yeah. any other sector. It's about the creative individual and what we need to be doing with them, what experiences they need to have, what placements, um, yeah. both placements into higher education and out. Um, and, and we're looking at our students and knowing they will be in their economically active careers yes. in, what, 2060, 2070? Yeah. So it's very hard to predict what the core um, experiences they need to have are. And I think we need to be looking not just at, at the who leads this grant, but at how we keep a legacy going forward afterwards. And, and I'm, sure that, I'm sure that's right. And it, it feeds to the question I was about to ask Tom, you're doing the job for me, which was, so uh, in the arts and humanities, I refuse to call them core disciplines, which I know makes me unpopular with certain parts of the community. But um, in, in arts and humanities p doctoral level, the, 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 um, an assumption tends to be that the, the, the deal is you get a PhD so you can go into academia. Um, and in our world, in the creative technologies world, because that's where I'm from too, and the creative world, lots and lots of people have now got post -doc doctoral and postdoctoral mm -hmm. level qualifications for things that I was there when we invented some of these things, you know, running web agencies. So as an employer, you want people with research skills at a higher level than you ever did, including those storytellers, etc., because they're operating in quite rarefied environments, intellectually? Um, absolutely. I, I think... Again, I can speak from McKenna's perspective, probably you know, yeah. um, represent a bunch of local communities as well. I mean, we're increasingly looking at PhD level recruits, um, mm -hmm. particularly in areas like you know, AI, data mm -hmm. analytics, yeah. you know, immersive technologies, simply because they are so new. There is no received best practice. And for us to, I guess, be competitive, we need to be bringing that best practice to our clients. Therefore, we need to get that real leadership from the universities um, because they will have you know, invented the underlying technologies or at least been part of you know, the team, the global team that's been part of creating you know, what's happening in AI, creating what's happening in immersive technology. So it becomes more and more vital that we can actually access that level of skill. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, mean, and I think I can speak for both universities because we've, we've just put in one of the DTP2 bids together okay. that, that uh, we very much see PhD students as not academic, it's not going to be their future career for most of them. No. It's going to be a career in the real world and, no. and we need to get them placed and experienced. Yeah, that's, if there's probably an oversupply of them in the yeah. sort of academic field. Yeah. But even just people starting companies, the sort of entrepreneurship point that came up from um, earlier on from the floor, you know, if we want more people with the skills to do that, more people with the resilience, with the kind of self-starting motivation stuff that comes from just being involved in institutions that think like this, presumably, um, and are sort of ready for this uncertain world of technological change and all the other stuff. Um, creative industry seems to be not a bad starting ground for some of that stuff. Richard? Yeah, can I, uh, it's different. I oh, know, different, question, different really. is fine, yeah. Um, you know, the, other, the other thing that I have liked that's come through loud and clear, and it's very, again, very different different to my general experience um, is this interest and support for the fact that we sit here on the island of Ireland and that the, the issues around that are amplified by, yep. by Brexit. It, you know, so I'm thinking about, okay, so how, I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, and it seems to me that that should certainly be a core element uh, or strand of, of our thinking. But when I try and apply that to, right, so how does that, how does that work through in the real world? How does that work through for an animation company or, right. or whatever? You know, I'm thinking about business models and I'm wondering to what extent, I mean, I, I, what I heard was that that's certainly not uh, locked out, but to, to what extent could we get, you know, finance, uh, ah. legal departments, you know, uh, business, uh, management team together to, to look at the best utilization of uh, the advantages of the island of Ireland. Is that, is that within scope or yeah. not? Well, I, I, would, I, I think in this particular place it absolutely is in scope. If it, if it plays back to the strengths of that cluster over time, yeah, I think it absolutely is in scope. I mean, 
the, the, U, the UK higher education industry is one of its best export industries as well as the creative industries. So the sort of combination of those two things I think could be really powerful. I think it is definitely in scope. And um, I mean, it should be said, you know, this has not been driven by your national politicians shouting at us in London. Yeah. This has been driven from the ground by us looking at it and saying, okay, here's, here's what is possible. Um, and also by it you know, being true that you, there is a creative industries cluster on a certain scale here already. Now, what I think is, is personally, I think is really encouraging is that already it seems from this room that, uh, that a number of these workshops have been in places where there have been N, where N is more than two universities in the room. Um, and, you know, they've been trying to jockey and find space and work out who should do what. And a number of, you know, I've had a number of calls from you know, quite senior people saying, so if we work with these people and those people, then that'll be a good bid, right? To which the answer is no, that'll be a consortium. That's not the same as a good bid, right? Um, you know, you might find they're not the same. Here, I think it's about how. You know, your bid is about how you do it um, and how it fits really tightly with the cluster. Um, and I say again, I will have no role in the decision. But I think that's a, it's, it's a different challenge um, because obviously there are different challenges on the ground here. But it is such a big game that it seems to be bringing people together, uh, which is good. But it's got to go back to Kitty and the companies and yeah. Tom and the companies and your question earlier to me, which is you need to surface them. Every, in every cluster, they need to be surfaced in such a way you can really find some of those, op those challenges that can actually be worked against. And that is, you know, there isn't a, there isn't a short list that says, there's a checklist that says the following eight things will be a good challenge. Mm. There just isn't. It's, too, it, it, it's broader than that. Um, one, one kind of final, before we go then, one final, these have been really useful in other places, one final top tip. If you were me, me being sort of notionally representing the programme, what would you do most, or what would you worry about most? It's the same thing. I'm going to come down the other way, starting with Tom. So if you were sitting in my chair on behalf of the HRC chairman, what would you think was my biggest opportunity or threat in this? I'm glad you're getting picked on this time. Yeah, me first. Uh, that's what they call good chairman. I know. Oh, I'm going to struggle here. Um, well, somebody have a go. You know, what could go wrong? Apart from everything. <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, I guess the money goes to where the money always goes. Mm -hmm. um, where does the money always go here? I guess well, next, my perception would be southeast. Oh, okay. Well, so just be really clear. <laughs> I could be wrong. We, we, we're at a program level, and the guys didn't say this, and if, uh, it's, if it's not official policy, it will be me personally speaking, not them. Um, the, the politics of this are that um, there will not be more than one at most London cluster. I think this is very likely because this very strong theory is that that is the correct thing to do. So London is trying to configure itself around that issue at the moment. There can be end bids, there might be one or two, but I don't think they're not going to be five of eight, nothing like, um, because there are genuine strong clusters around the, 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 the nations and the rest of, the, of England. So I would be extraordinarily surprised if that's what happens. I cannot determine it, but I will be extraordinarily surprised because that's not the way this program has been configured. I would strongly urge you not to think like that. I would strongly urge you to be confident the way Richard is saying and really look at the heart of what the bid is. Get it tight. Know that you'd be confident you can deliver it in it like you would with a pitch um, and go for it that way. So I don't think it will go to the southeast. It is indicative of the fact that it is not just going to happen, that we are here and that everybody on the team um, including myself, are here. I think you should also clock, from Richard's point, that the opening keynote this morning was from who it was from and why that might be a, a symbolic indication of some ideas that, were, that we think you should play to. Um, but there's no judgment in this. You know, but um, what there will not be is a prejudged down to the, the usual suspects. The reason is not political. It's that they're just not configured. The DTPs are not configured to solve the challenges. The groups are not configured to solve the challenges that the industry is playing. It's, a, it's an equally scary level playing field for almost all the HEIs that are involved. So it's sort of not a very politic answer, but I think it's not going to happen like that. But if I'm wrong, and I don't think I will be, then I'll, um, I'll say sorry. Okay. Uh, Moving swiftly along. Moving swiftly along. Uh, I, I have one. Go on. No, because I wasn't first this time. That's fine. Go, go. Um, kind of picking up on something Richard said earlier about having an international mindset, yeah. I would be cautious that whatever the projects or things the research and development goes forward, that yes, it's about 
um, growth of the clusters, but it should be with an international mindset. It shouldn't just be replicating or growing yes. just us without looking outside yep. and saying, okay, what's Sweden doing? What's Finland up to? Good what's call. that crazy thing Malta's at? Good call. And, and looking at those whilst also looking at what we've got. Is there a crazy thing Malta's at? I'd love there to know. There is a crazy is. thing Malta's at. So that's good to know. Yeah, um, actually, the way to feed in, uh, other people in the room, the way to feed into that process, of course, is to suggest to us in the peer review process who should be involved in the conversations, for instance, if there are great people doing that crazy thing that Malta's at, which I've never said on a panel before, I'm loving that. Um, if there are those, tell us, then we can find them and we can get them to help us with their experience in making our decisions. Um, um, so um, who's having next, Karen and then Rich? I, I think I'd be wary of anything that looks too tidy because we yes. have got a very short time to get this together yes. and I think the creative industries are always messy anyway. Yep. But I think we, we should be wary both as, as people trying to write a bit but also at the peer review end that anything that looks too tidy I'd be very suspicious of. So you, like me, are allergic to neatness. That's good. I like if that. it looks as if it's definitely going to achieve everything, it's not ambitious enough then. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I like that call. That's, that's good. Good. Um, and Richard. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, balance. Is, balance is, is, is the big issue. And it, um, I could see it. There are some parts of the creative industries that it's easier to see the application right. than other parts. And I think, um, you know, if I look at our, uh, for our, at our cluster here, it's actually quite broad, and I would, I would certainly be look at, concerned that everything gets sucked into one thing, um, uh, and I would think that would be a mistake. And I understand that at the other end of the spectrum, it can't be all things to all people. But it, I think the middle, the middle ground for me. I mean, we, you know, we support. Uh, five or six different sectors, I would be looking for a coherent intervention in, a, in every one of, the, you know, as a sort of starting point, in every one of those sectors. Uh, and if it, didn't, if it didn't have that, then it wouldn't be, to your point, ambitious enough, and it wouldn't be to, uh, you know, to Basel Jets, to, to our own cluster, it wouldn't be coherent with the structure of our cluster. So there's sort of a balance. It can't be, we're just going to do this. Uh, and obviously it can't be, you know, whatever you're having yourself. But, you know, there needs to be a, a coherent breadth to it. And every one of those sectors, whether it's animation, you know, gaming interactive, um, you know, entertainment, factual, TV drama, needs to be able to look, if it's going to do the, the bigger benefits that I'm seeing it as, which is a kind of a, at the vanguard of a of a recalibration of U UK, the way UK looks at the creative industries, then you know every one of those sectors needs to go. Okay, that is designed to have some contribution in our mm -hmm. in our sector. You know whether you know there has, there has to be the right to fail, but you know there has to be a kind of clear read across. And so the danger is that there might not be. Okay, so it's interesting. So I just. I suppose I'd just remind everybody then, in the context of that, that we've got responsibility to f for up to eight of these. And so we absolutely have to think like that. And you have national responsibility, which means you also have to sometimes think like that, but they're not necessarily coterminous. Yeah. Um, so we cannot do eight in the screen industries, probably, whilst looking like we meet the programme objectives. Not saying, just naming the screen industries, or fashion, or whatever. So we do have that issue. But actually, an individual cluster challenge could be absolutely, you could absolutely do as you're describing. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But the, the challenge that is described, if it's neat and you find six sectors and divide n million by six, it won't, it won't look like a real challenge. I'm not saying you're saying that. Um, so just, I would just say, make sure you find that balance. That balance is the absolute key to it. Because when we look at creative industries, we look at that entire 17 or whatever it currently is sector list, and we have to think about it that way too. So. Um, Point out the interoperabilities. Point out the way these things relate to each other, um, and I understand the, you know the politics of this as well. But um, I would I would just urge you to make sure that when we come to measure the impact of it, we know where it is, um, and you can credibly argue where it's going to be. And it doesn't matter whether that's six sectors or all of them at that point. But if um, if the challenge is I don't think this is it. If the challenge is how do we go the best possible creative industries cluster in Northern Ireland? It's just too big. 
for what we've got to do with this particular money. It may be what happens next after this. So I think you're right to say it's a balance question. It's a really tricky balance question, particularly in a nation. It's not so hard if you're Manchester and you're oh, just picking one and you're going, okay, do we do fashion, do we do TV, what do we do? It's much harder at a national level. Um, so that, I think that's one of, the one of the, now the downside, it's a difficulty, challenge of being a nation. The same is happening in Scotland, actually, although they have a different challenge in Scotland because it's got more universities, it's got a wider spread of um, interested <coughs> parties. So they're having that challenge as well. I would say talk to the team as much as possible as you're developing it to, to try and find that balance. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a tricky one. Because yeah. um, there is a tendency, it's such an exciting sum of money at such a scale that we want to make sure it works as far as possible. But on the other hand, we know... But it still ultimately has to be, you know, what... You know, while, while the, the wider agenda is not the same as Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland's agenda, it is not... It's not conceivable that the wider agenda can be served best by an agenda that doesn't work for Northern Ireland. No, that's true. That's absolutely yeah, true. So it does that's have to come true. from here and, and kind of develop up. No, I buy that, yeah. I completely agree with that. Yeah, of course. Okay, uh, I think we're done. Um, thank you very much for your advice and for your challenging thoughts and questions and for your contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our panel. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, guys.